I made 100% on my money. Now, what happens if I go out and I borrow a dollar and then I make two dollars? My cash on cash was infinite, but my ROI was 200%. Now that was real simple. I'm gonna go through this in depth, but let's talk about that. Cash on cash is what is the return on the money I put into the deal. You following that? Yep. Like, if the deal's 100 grand, but I've only got 10,000 into it, and the deal makes 20 grand, I just made a 100% return on my money, or 200% return on my money, whatever it ends up being. Cash on cash is the return on the money that I put into the deal. Now, ROI is the return on the entire deal itself. That includes the leverage, everything else. Like if I, if I, if I, if I borrow $90,000 and I put 10,000 of my own money into the deal, there's $100,000 tied up in that right. deal. And let's say it makes 10,000 that year, I made 10%. You okay. following that? Yep. 10% ROI. Right. Ask me questions. So, so just to make sure, because I'm, I'm slow as I'll get up. Then ask but me as many questions as you The return on investment is the total amount of cash invested. That, if I got to borrow $5 from Ryan and $20 from Corey and, then, and, and 100 from you, I'm at $125 in. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, if I make 250 that's 100% ROI. You made 100% return on the investment. Okay, perfect. So that's different than cash on cash return. I'm, um, I'm pr- and so cash on cash is only looking at the deal based on the money that you put into it. I got you. And the money that you got back from it. Which is why it's called debt eight. You know, when you, when you, Corey underwrites a lot of his stuff at 80%, mm-hmm. um, and you know, that's how he does his business because that's where his lending's at. But when he's under that 80% mark, he's got zero personal dollars in. So it's an infinite amount of cash return. Mm-hmm. So because that's debt Gotcha. So his cash on cash for that deal is infinite. So for those of you that are not following along with what I'm saying there, what, there's another guy out here called Corey Thompson. He, he, he talks a lot about dead eight investing. And let's talk about that for two seconds. If you've got an eight, it's a figure eight. If you've got an eight and you flip it sideways, that becomes an infinity symbol. So Corey's term for that is dead eight. It's a dead eight investment, meaning that he got infinite returns out of it. He doesn't have a dime of his own money tied up into it. And the money that's coming back to him every single time is straight up cash that he never that he never had to put into it so cash on cash is analyzing the amount of money you have in the deal ROI is analyzing the return from the deal itself gotcha good all right let's get into this so we're gonna start talking about mobile homes and how I expect to make 150 percent cash on cash returns every time I do a deal and if you're doing 150 percent returns and you've got money tied up in the stock market pulling seven percent four percent ten percent even 18 20 percent Mobile homes is an opportunity to pull 150% returns without a problem. So let's talk about it. All right, CMA, I'm gonna go ahead and cover my assets real quick. And basically everything I'm gonna be teaching you is based upon my own knowledge. I'm not a licensed, you know, much of anything. I was a licensed mobile home broker. I did have my, I was a licensed retailer, licensed broker, licensed installer. Uh, I have since let those licenses lapse because I'm not doing these deals much anymore. Why would you have to be a licensed mobile home broker? All right. so. Now, laws in the United States change. It's different from state to state, but in Texas, you're only allowed to sell one mobile home in a rolling 12-month period. Meaning, if I buy one today, if I sell one today, November, whatever it is today, I cannot sell another mobile home until November, whatever today is next year. So the reason you get licensed is in Texas, if I wanna sell more than one a year, I'm supposed to be licensed. Right. Um, so, things to think about. And it, th- there's a lot of people that aren't mm-hmm. that do this, a lot of, especially a lot of wholesalers um, that, that never thought, I never thought about that until somebody brought it up to mm-hmm. me. So now wholesaling might be a different, it's a different story because if we're assigning contracts, are we selling mobile homes? I understand where you're going with so, that. Okay. So that's a slightly different story. So now uh, for those that may have not caught that, whenever I sell a mobile home, the title is in my name and I transfer that title to you, that is a sale. But if I go to you and I contract a mobile home and I sell that contract to somebody else, that is not a sale of a mobile home, that is a sale of a contract. Right. So I can sell as many contracts as I want to, but what we're gonna be talking about today with mobile homes is personal property. Yes. We're not gonna be dealing with real property at all today. And I will define and show you the differences between the two. 
big does, difference. Does it change once once it's been uh, once it's been made real property? Yes, that fall once it becomes real property, it's a house. It's a house. Okay, so you could yeah. trade infinite amounts. Yep. In a year, as long as it's real property. As long as it's real property, it does not fall under Texas mobile home law, uh, and because of that, you can do pretty much whatever you would do with the house to that house. Would that be the case when you're buying one that's personal property and you convert it in the closing process to real property? Once it converts to real property, I am gray on that okay. area, but I'm going to lean towards it's real so, property and it is real property. So talk to your title attorney or whoever yeah. you need to um, to figure that out, but but that's typically how my transactions go. They're converted over. Converted in, over to real in, property? In the process. All right. I, I've only bought them on land. I haven't bought like you're talking well, about. Well, I'm going to show you how to buy them on parks or even buy them on land as personal property and show you how you could possibly pull that down. So if everybody's read the covering my assets aspect of it, essentially this is my experience and my goal is to help you figure this out. My experience is strictly in Texas. Outside of Texas, your laws may change. Do some research, do some analyzing, but I'm going to teach you overall what's called a Lonnie deal. I'm going to show you how to knock down a Lonnie deal. So Lonnie Scruggs, for those that don't know, Lonnie Scruggs was a badass in mobile home investing. Like he straight up, at the very least, pioneered the teaching of it. So, well, he wrote the first book on it, right? Deals on Wheels, yeah. I believe, is what he wrote. Uh, he's a legend in the mobile home business, and uh, what I'm about to show you is essentially the a, a process that he pioneered. So. An introduction to mobile homes. First thing I'm going to need to do is clear up a couple stereotypes. Um, throw some out there for me real quick. What are some of the stereotypes you hear? Uh, it's trailer park, uh, yeah. tornado magnet, you know. Trailer park trash. It's, yeah. it, it is what it is. Uh, it's, it's a stereotype you're going to hear. You're going to hear people call them, t uh, you know, low class people that live in the mobile homes, that they're tornado magnets, poor construction standards. These are all types of things that we're going to hear people say all the time about mobile homes. Some of it's true. Absolutely. Sometimes stereotypes are based upon a sliver of truth. You know, it's not the reality, but there's enough reality there that it becomes a stereotype. Well, we, I think we, you've seen a lot more than me, but in my short internship here as a, as a real estate investor, I've seen the parks that nobody took care of, mm -hmm. that, that people weren't following the rules, they weren't doing what they had to do. And, and that's where a lot of these, these stereotypes That's where come. those stereotypes come from because I have seen parks that were absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely. I mean, parks that were just like, wow, man, I want to live here kind of parks. Right. Um, but it all boils down to the management of the park itself. If you have a really crappy manager on that park, you're going to have a really crappy park. If you have a really good manager at that park, it's going to be a really good manager. Uh, real quick, Rajoli, can you repeat how many sales of mobile homes as personal property can you do in one year without a license? I believe it is one. One, and that is Texas. I'm gonna, everything I'm gonna have to do about this class is gonna be based on Texas law. Uh, it's one in a trailing 24 month, or a, tra a trailing 12 month period. It's not the same as a year. Uh, it's not a calendar year, it's not January to December. It's not like I can sell one today and then sell one in January because it's not a one year period calendar right. year. It's a 12 month rolling transaction. So I can only sell one every 12 months. Okay, so we we're talked about the low class side of it. Let's talk about the tornado magnets side of it because I need, I need to get the stereotypes out of the way because it's unbelievable how many real estate investors will say, I won't invest in mobile homes. I won't invest in mobile homes. I'm an investor. I invest in numbers. I don't give a damn what the asset class is. If the numbers make sense, I want to invest in it. So for those people that are skipping mobile homes, I feel like they're doing their business a disservice because they are passing up awesome opportunities for great numbers, great numbers. So the tornado magnet aspect of it. So, well, a lot of that's changed too, right? Now, now especially if it's going to be FHA accredited mobile home, this would be on land, but they're strapped down. Okay. That's a whole different class. They're, mm -hmm. you know, I, I promise you I've seen them. I grew up out in the country where a farmer needed a, a, a trailer on his place and he pulled it out there, stuck whatever he could under it, kind of leveled it and hooked it up to a septic system. Called it done. And, and that thing would roll up in a strong wind. That's what happens, <laughs> right? Because it wasn't done correctly. Right. But when done correctly, 
they're, they're very stable. They're very stable properties. Um, so there's a couple of things to look at on that, and we're going to talk more about that in a bit, but the standards for mobile home construction has gone through the roof. They are, right. they are on par in many ways for, for serving their needs. And the tornado magnet aspect of it, the stereotype pretty much comes from the older days, probably prior to the mid-1970s, where the mobile homes were being built without any construction standards. It was wherever you bought it from is wherever you bought it from, right. and whatever they gave you is whatever they gave you. But there has been a lot of regulation put into the construction of them, and it's definitely increased the value of them as far as their construction. They're, they're just better. Well, and a lot of this stuff, I mean, it's kind of like they were built more like RVs, which mm -hmm. RVs were not meant to be inhabited for right. long periods of time. People do it, but you're talking about Luon construction and a lot of stuff. The, the construction materials inside of new Cheap. mobile homes are much better than they used to be. Yeah, they, they really are. What's up? Uh, Dustin asks, where do you find information on each state laws regarding mobile home sales? Uh, the best, my, my best and honest answer is just going to be mob, just search mobile home laws or no, let, let's, let's re rewind that, manufactured home laws in, in your state. Uh, you're going to have to just search and research and research. The, I literally, the way I learned so much about mobile homes is I read the mobile home laws. Uh, I literally just went out like uh, 10 TAC 80, I read that, I read MHSA 1201, I read I read Texas Property Code Chapter 94, I believe it was. So if you want to read those, 10 TAC 80 is one of them. Uh, Texas Administrative Code 80, uh, Book 10, Texas Administrative Code 80, MHSA um, 1201, I believe it is, and it is Texas Property Code Chapter 94. So those three are the ones that I personally read. If you have to research this in your state, I think the best resource for you to go to is going to be the state. Find out who's regulating that within your state. That might be the Department of Transportation, the Department of Public Safety. Find out who regulates that. Find out what laws are being regulated and read them. It's gonna be your best opportunity to get it straight from the cat's mouth. So, so in your experience, cause this is, this is gonna come into this. Now you're buying a lot of used mobile homes. All use. I've never bought a new one. How do the poor construction standards of the past do, are, are, do those affect you? Um, we'll get into that. Okay. That's definitely something we're going to get into. So, what I just need to understand and what I need to let everybody know that's watching right now is f your stereotypes. Right. I mean, get them out of your head. If you are truly interested in returns, this is a great place to get them. Yeah. So my perception on this was always what Daniel was talking about. Like, so I come from the country and everybody's struggling to get out of a mobile home, right? Mm -hmm. Like everybody's, you know, we see the baby in Walmart with no, in a diaper, right? And we, we don't, you know, that's the stereotype, yep. right? Yeah, that's, that's the stereotype. So we're, we're all struggling to get out. We never want to go back. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's the reality of it. But when you look at this as a number standpoint and you can go buy you a $250,000 around a house around the corner here, that's going to rent for 1900 bucks. Mm -hmm. And your loan like on it's 12, 1300. Or you can go buy a mobile home park with 10 trailers in it for a quarter million dollars that are renting for eight, $800 a month. The, mm -hmm. the, math, the math explains itself. I love mobile homes. What I'm going to tell you today, and while I am a big fan of mobile home parks, today's class is not on mobile home parks. Oh, I get you. Today's class is on personal property gotcha. and notes, and I'm going to teach you how to pull that off. So let's get those stereotypes out of our head and just remember that we are investing into numbers, not asset classes. Right. All right. So let's move on. So a lot of times this is what people are thinking when they talk about mobile homes. They're, they're thinking, you know, trailer trash, just some, some, some you know, backwoods, hillbilly stuff that's just, just, you know, that's what our image is. You know, we see stuff like that. That's what we're thinking. But overall, does that look like a mobile home? No. no that, that right there is a mobile home. Beautiful. Mobile homes can look phenomenal. And I don't know of too many investors that would look at that and be like, you know what, that doesn't look like an asset I want to own. Well, they call that a modular home. That's how they church that up. <laughs> they, they might want to call that a modular home. We'll go through the definition of that because there is some varying understandings of those definitions. Right. We need to define those for you today. But I don't know of many investors that wouldn't want to buy that. Right. No, it's beautiful. I probably, depending upon the terms, you know, that's not going to be my typical mobile home, but I need to show you. Mobile homes can look badass. I right. mean, they, they really can. But let's take a look at this. There's another mobile home. There's a nice looking double wide. It's got a little bit of landscaping on it. It's set on a nice foundation. It's got a nice little front porch area. Not a bad looking house at all. Once again, though, for the type of returns that I'm looking to get, that's probably not what I'm buying. 
Oh, it's probably not what I'm buying. Let me pop up this one though. You see that one? Yep. How many people want to live there? Not me. You know, I've lived in homes like that. I've grown up in houses like that, but that's not what I want to go back to. Kind of like what you were saying, you know, a lot of us are wanting to get away, f away from that. But those right there, those mobile homes right there are the ones that make you the best returns on investment. That's a mid 1980s construction property. I can see right now that we got a window unit hanging out the front of it. I got vinyl skirt siding on it. I got a small uh, st um, set of stairs on the side. But overall, right now that mobile home looks pretty meh. But how much would it really cost to paint the outside of that thing? I could probably get the, out the entire outside of that thing painted for under a grand. Yeah, and even on the inside, I mean, you're talking five to ten grand. You can do a lot of. You can do a lot. ton of stuff to a mobile home for ten grand. I can like, practically rebuild one for ten grand. Right. And, the, and that's what people don't understand about it. Right. They, they think you're buying a five thousand dollar. Oh, I don't know what you'd pay for this. I'd pay no more than, depending upon what the inside of it looked like, the max I would pay for it is probably eight grand. Okay. And I would try and get it for under five. And that makes sense. So I've had two of these thrown at me this week, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what to do with them because I only know how to do them on, on land. On land. Okay. Right. So I've got two two that were thrown at me this week, and and I couldn't do anything with it. But I'm going to show you how to do this in a park. Okay. So I'm going to show you how to do mobile homes in mobile home parks. Which is where these are. Yep. So if I find one of these in a mobile home park and I can get it for less than eight grand all in, under eight grand all in, I don't like being into a mobile home for more than eight grand, I'll do the deal. So, and one question I would throw out there because I've seen this recently uh, and maybe you can address it as you go along is, I've seen a lot of these parks are trying to push out the older homes. Mm -hmm. um, and there, a lot of the parks around locally have been bought up by conglomerates. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to push out a lot of the private owned ones so they can bring their own in and owner finance their own out. Exactly. So they're trying to compete with you on your business model. That means you're not going to work in their park. Right. There are hundreds and hundreds of parks in DFW, literally hundreds and hundreds of parks in DFW. Right. Find the ones that will allow you to do your business and go to town. Gotcha. Because, I, I mean, in... And I've seen other people that have done this. They went in and bought one, and then immediately, you know, a day or two later, they're like, hey, they're telling us to get out, you know. Okay, so we'll go. We'll address Perfect. that. Perfect. We're going to address that. Most definitely, we're going to address that here. But what I want to show you is that's how I retired myself. Those right there, remember how I told you whenever I got started how my path went right. and then how I got to a point where I was barely covering bills and I had to change my mindset? Mm -hmm. I started buying these things up. And most of all of my deals were done in three mobile home parks. Almost all of my deals were done in three mobile home parks, but I started buying these things and turning them into three to four hundred dollars a month in cash flow, straight positive cash flow every single month without being a landlord or a tenant. I did it all with notes. No toilets to change. No toilets, no nothing. I'm a landlord. I own the. I'm not a landlord. I'm the bank. Right. And I'll show you how to do that. So with Beautiful. these right here, these are the types of deals I'm looking for. Stuff like this. That right there. I might not really want that. But if somebody gave it to me for free. It still got the tongue on it. That's a good thing. It still got the tongue on it. It's a good thing and a bad thing. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things right here that I'm seeing that I don't like about this. And then I'll express to you the things that I do like about this. All right, what I don't like about it right now is it does still have the tongue on it. Because I want to keep that thing where it's at. I don't oh, want to move them. If, if I have to move it, I'm probably looking to spend at least five grand. At least five grand to move it because I'm going to pay for the mover. I'm going to pay for the electrician, the air conditioning guy. I'm going to pay for the plumber. I'm going to pay for all that stuff. I don't want to pay for all that. It screws my returns up. The reason I'm able to get such great cash on cash returns is because I am able to get them so cheap. Now, I've had people offer to give me homes like this. Give them just like... Because they want them gone. They, they, Either they want them gone off their land or they've moved and it's in a mobile home park that charges them lot rent and they can't afford the lot rent and their new apartment. Gotcha. And they tried selling it for what they bought it for. Let's say they bought it for five grand. They bought that unit for five grand and they've been trying to sell it for two to three months. They couldn't sell it for five grand. So they moved. And now that they've moved, they've still got to pay for their apartment and they still have to pay for this lot rent and they can't afford the lot rent anymore. And they just get frustrated. It's like, whoever takes it can have it. I've on more than one occasion had three mobile homes. On three, I've had three mobile homes given to me. I've got a Ryan question, mm -hmm. um, and this may be super basic, but I mean that's what this is for. In the case of the tongue, I can obviously assume what the tongue is for. Can you get into that? But also get into the fact of, okay, is that a normal thing for the tongue to still be there? Once it's there, is the tongue removed? Okay, like just yeah, go into yeah. the tongue. So I'll, I'll explain that here a little bit. Texas 
As an installer in Texas, when a mobile home is installed, I am required to remove the tongue and place it underneath mm. the front. So for that to have been properly installed, that tongue needs to be removed. Are, are they bolted on or welded? Uh, some of the older ones are welded on, and if they're welded on, they're stuck. But the new ones are bolted on, and they're not supposed to remain there. I'm supposed to remove them and put them underneath the underneath as That's an good installer. Knowledge. I didn't know that because I've, I've actually come on these where I've, I've got a $3,000 nice mobile home, mm -hmm. could be done something with, but they hacked the tongue off with a torch. Okay. And then Load one back on. Okay. Well, and I didn't know the liability of trying to weld another one back on. Neither do I, but I'd get a good welder. <laughs> Neither okay. do I. Uh, I can't really tell from this picture, but if we're going back into the installation standards, at least here in Texas, uh, Texas has done a very good job of putting solid standards in. Uh, whenever a mobile home is installed, like 90 plus percent of them, and I forget the, the exact term, but 90, this isn't like anecdotal. 90 plus percent of them are inspected by the state. So we know that they're being installed properly. So other things that I'm seeing about this is the way that the bricks, not the bricks, but if we look at this right here, these cinder blocks, it's hard to tell in the picture, but from my experience, they don't look like they're properly stacked. Uh, the height of them seems a little high. I'm not seeing really any strapping coming in underneath this. Uh, I don't have any skirting on this. I have to have skirting on a mobile home for moisture control. Uh, I've got double, step, double stacked front stairs over here. And I can tell that this home was built prior to probably, it was built after the 1976 and probably before 1983. And the reason I'm able to know that is if I look at that roof, it has a very slight curve to it, a very, very slight curve to it. Anything built after 83 has a pitch, a solid pitch, and anything built before 76 more than likely didn't have much of a curve to it at all. So what I'm looking at on here is it's not installed properly. So if I, if I do end up owning this, I'm gonna have to have it reinstalled. That doesn't mean I need to get like a tractor trailer out there and move it around, but I'm gonna need to get somebody to come out there, properly set the cinder blocks, properly set the strapping, properly put a, put a, put a, put a skirt on it, and fix the front stairs, and I know that just looking at this. Does it matter what kind of cinder blocks are on it? It does, it does. So the cinder blocks used for a mobile home installation are like super dark gray. They're like their PSI is much higher than your average light gray ones. Mm -hmm. So just looking at it right now, I don't think those are the right cinder blocks. I can tell that they're not stacked properly. There is a specific way that they're supposed to be stacked. And just overall looking at it, I know that I need to get somebody to come in there and fix it. But how much does that cost? Oh, it doesn't cost much. It doesn't cost much at all. The only, only reason I bring it up, if, you get, if you're looking under a mobile home and there's hate out blocks under there, mm -hmm. which are the ones with the holes in the middle, those yes. are wrong. Yep. They're, not, they're not supposed to be there. They don't have the PSI, mm -hmm. which, is, which is the pound per square inch tensile strength in the concrete that, that Daniel's talking about. And they're, they're also hollow, so they don't have the strength that mm -hmm. the solid blocks do. So this is just things for you to be thinking about. And you don't have to know all of this, but you better get educated on mobile homes if you want to do a lot of them, because it's important to have some basic understandings of how these things work. So those are all things that I'm seeing right off the bat without ever even walking into it. But how much is it going to cost for me to fix that? I'd say anywhere between three to six hundred dollars. That's not a whole lot of funds to fix how it was installed. Skirting would probably cost me about another seven to eight hundred bucks. Um, and then those front steps, maybe a hundred to two hundred bucks to get those front steps repaired. Do I got a question? I was just going to say that uh, Corey Thompson, just off the picture, was just saying there's no moisture barrier mm -hmm. and it's too tall. Yep. So, yep. Height. You can go as high as you want to with a mobile home. I can, I can set a mobile home 48 foot up in the air for all I care, as long as like we're not hitting like FHA or FAA flight standards. You can build them as high as you want, but the state puts in a standard that says um, you can only go so high without an engineer's report. So if I go over, I believe it's 48 inches, and I, it, it wow. may even be 36 inches. If I go over that height, I have to have get an engineered, engineered foundation. So. so so the other thing about the about the the wrap, I learned this from Corey last week. It's very important for freeze freeze prevention too, yeah, not just not putting just that skirting on because you get that you get that airflow under there and it can cause you a lot of problems. You have to have that skirting on them. They are they're designed that way. And there's a few other things to think about when we're talking about the construction of these things. But moisture is a big problem for mobile homes. You have to control control your moisture. <laughs> It's not a bad looking trailer though. That's not a bad looking trailer. <laughs> but I probably wouldn't want to pay more than a thousand bucks for it. If somebody was trying to get me to buy that, I would probably put my offer in somewhere around a grand because where do I want to be at all in on one of these? Right. Where? 
No more than eight. No more than eight. No more got than eight it. grand. So if I if I got that for a grand, that gives me seven thousand dollars to make that mobile home look good. And I guarantee you I can do it on the outside. I'm probably looking at about twenty five hundred bucks to make the outside of that thing pop. I'm sure you're going to go into, but there's it's obvious that eight's not an arbitrary number. Yeah. It's because once I start getting over eight, my cash on cash starts becoming slim because my resale value is marginally arbitrary. But for me, I like 100 plus cash on cash, 100 percent plus cash on cash. And that's hard to do when you start getting over eight grand because your cash flow coming in is not going to hit those returns. Are you going to talk about how you set up the notes? Yep. Okay. I'm going to show you how to set the notes up. I'm going to show you how to transfer titles. I'm going to show you how to set up UCC security agreements. I'm going to show it all to you. Awesome. So anybody that's watching today, this is not going to be a high level, you know, sales pitch class. This is straight up. I'm going to go through the paperwork. I'm going to go through all of it with you. So that way, by the time this is said and done with, you have a clear cut understanding on how to do these types of deals. So let's keep going. The primary benefits of investing into mobile homes. Why invest in these things? They're cheap to buy and fix, and they're hard to secure financing. So I'm gonna break that down for a couple seconds. I can buy them real cheap, but it's hard for people to find loans on them. All right, I go out and I buy myself a brand new truck today. I am very much aware that if I buy that brand new truck, that within the next 10 years, it's not gonna be worth what I bought it for. Right. In fact, within minutes of me buying it, it's not worth what I bought it for. Um, that's a very much a reality. It's no different with mobile homes. Mobile homes are depreciating assets. You know, I buy one for 60 grand, in 15 years it might be worth 10. You know, that's the reality behind mobile homes and that's a bad, bad thing if you're gonna own them. We are the banks on this side though. So if I got, let's say I'm going out and I need to find a new car and I need a new car and I'm broke, I'm broke as broke can be, you see those little tote the note car lots on the side of the road, you know, buy here, pay here car lots. They're selling a 1989 Honda right. Civic with 200,000 miles on it for $8,000. How in the hell are they selling a 1989 Honda Civic for $8,000? Selling to somebody who can't get financing any other way. Yep. They have to have a way to get to work or they lose their job. And they have to have it. Now, and they're almost always covering the down payment or in the down payment of their car, they're, they're covering the cost they paid at the auction for it. Exactly. Now that might sound to some people like we're taking advantage of somebody. We're, we're, putting, we're putting people, we're setting people up in, in bad ways. Well, let's look at the risk that I have. If I sell that person that Honda for $2,000 and my profit on that, let's say I bought it for 1500 bucks at the auction, I sell it to them for 2000 on payments and they leave that car lot and they have horrible credit, horrible payment history and they disappear and run away with it. What happens to me? I just lost all my money on a gamble because they're low credit, you know, month to month pays. Right. I have to pad my risk in that because there's going to be lots of defaults. So to pad my risk in that, I sell it at a higher price, but they're willing to pay that because I give them a monthly price that they can afford. No different than with mobile homes. Let's take a look at a mobile home scenario. Let's say mom and pop buy this mobile home for 60 grand in a mobile home park and they live there for 15 years, 20 years, and it's time to sell. They're going to have a reality and that reality is they're not going to be able to sell it for what they bought it for. And they're already aware of that. They know that. But they're, they're seeing other homes similar to their selling for fifteen to $20,000 through these dealers. And they're gonna try and sell it for what they see these dealers pay for it. Now there is a chance that they're gonna find somebody that'll come by and pay mm -hmm. that cash. But it is not too common. You're not gonna typically find a mobile home buyer that's willing to pay fifteen to twenty k cash and live in it. They do happen all the time. I'm not even trying to pretend like they don't. But you're gonna find far more people that could buy that home as if you offered financing with it. Because although grandma and grandpa wanna sell that house for twenty grand, their best chance of getting twenty grand for it is if they offer financing with it because nobody's gonna finance it. There's not a bank out there that's gonna finance it. I'm not gonna be able to go out and find a 1989 Honda and then go to Chase of a, JP Morgan Chase and yeah, say, they finance. On that. they're not gonna loan on that car. And, and grandma's only gonna loan it on, on your first one. The, the next time you need one, she ain't got the money. See, so what we do as investors is we solve this problem right here, and that is that it's hard to secure financing. As an investor, I'm gonna buy it as cheap as I can, and then I'll become the bank on it, and I'll become the buy here, pay here car lot. I'll buy that mobile home as personal property, and then I'll turn around and, let's say I buy it all in for eight grand, I'll turn around and owner finance it to somebody for 30,000 with 5,000 down. 
And if I get that 5,000 down, that only leaves me with 3,000 of my own capital right. at risk. And if I sell it for 30 grand on a five year note, I'm bringing in five to 600 bucks a month in payments. Well, five to 600 bucks a month in payment does a real good job of knocking out 3,000 in risk fast. Follow, Absolutely. Ask me questions if you don't follow me. No, well, so I just kind of had a realization here. Like, mm -hmm. so I'm continually getting hit in the face with my own uh, failures, mm -hmm. but but that's a good thing. You should you should you should understand your failures. This is something that Corey's been trying to explain to me for a while, and as I told you, I've had some kind of churn in the last couple of weeks. This this price range is something that I've come across ten of these in the last year. I I could have made this work. I didn't I didn't know it until well I. I knew it. I didn't want to listen to anybody till like two weeks ago, because y'all tell people all the time. You tell people. Ryan tells people. Everybody tells people that money's easy to find, and it is. You can find ten grand to go buy one of these. Most definitely, and I'll, and I'll explain to you real quick because we're going to talk about this a lot, and I don't want to jump too far ahead. If I can make a hundred and fifty percent return on this, and I can find somebody that's got twenty grand sitting in an IRA somewhere, I'll be like, I'll give you twenty percent return on your money. That might be usurious. I don't know. Let's 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 ignore usury right now. We'll just Between throw out, friends. It's good. Let, let, let's just throw some thought processes out there. I'll give it to them at eighteen percent. I'll give them to them seventeen percent. I don't really care. Uh, I'm not going to get into usury right now. I'll give them a solid return on their cash. And if they're making twenty percent on their cash, and I got a hundred and fifty percent return deal. I'm making 130% on dead eight investing with somebody else's cap. Right. You following me? Yeah, and I mean, even if you can't find that, there's somebody out there that'll partner with you for 50% of that deal. Hell yeah. Because they can't get that money sitting in their, in their CD at the bank. They're getting a half a percent right mm -hmm. now. I mean, it's your dentist, it's your doctor, anybody else. What's up, Ryan? Uh, Christopher Coy, Daniel, when owner financing them in a park, do you roll lot rent into the payment or have the payment split between you and the park? I will discuss that more, but I do have them send it all to me, which technically becomes means I become an escrow and there might be financing law and other things else like that, crediting, a lot of other things involved with that. But to short answer, and I'm gonna discuss this more further on in this class is yes, I have them pay lot rent to me and I have them pay 100% of their insurance lot rent and everything else directly to me and I disperse it from them. There. okay so we'll discuss that more in a little bit because some people might say that what I'm doing there is illegal um, and th what I'm gonna admit is it might be it might be there are but you make sure it gets paid and that's where I that's where I want to, to, to focus on is there's a book out there and it's like a felony a day or three felonies a day is what the book's called and it's written by I believe like an FBI agent and he said essentially said that there are so many laws on mm -hmm. this book uh, on the books that as a average individual that is trying to cause no problems in this world whatsoever on average they commit about one felony a day um, there's just that many laws out there right. so is am I allowed to you're, escrow that? You're a felonious individual. <laughs> am I allowed to escrow that? Maybe not. Uh, but the way I look at it is, am I going to feel comfortable standing in front of a judge? And if I stand in front of a judge and say, yes, I brought their payments in and I dispersed their payments as I was supposed to, I have done no wrong. Show me anywhere where somebody's lot rent was not paid. Did I do anything mal malicious? No. Not, not at all. So now, if I was taking and escrowing their payments and not paying, then yeah, all day long, you know, throw me in jail. So, so I've had the experience on a rent house where I was escrowing the insurance. I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I was trying to because I had people not paying it before that. This right. was a, it was a, it wasn't a rent house. It was a uh, owner finance. Owner situation. finance. Nope. Um, but I, this was before I knew about y'all. I knew mm -hmm. about uh, you know uh, companies and RMLO that would help me. Right. Like I was listening to some old man that mm -hmm. like, hey, here's a here's a contract. You know. Right. Um, I had a claim come up and that claim got denied. They said it was a foundation claim. They're like, oh, there's been water. You mm. know, it's been raining. Typical North Texas answer. Right. Um, and I had drama that popped up in my life because the, the tenant was mad because it wasn't covered. Right. Um, or the, the, the owner. owner. It's um, not a tenant anymore. Owner, it's an owner. My, my fault. Yeah. But, but this caused problems. That's stuff you got to be aware of that could happen mm -hmm. if, if you're doing this. And you got to have the answers for when it does. So I we'll didn't. discuss that more here in a little bit. We'll discuss that more in a little bit because it is part of this. So hard to secure financing, but since it is hard to hard to secure financing, it opens up the doors for creative financing. It gives us the ability to get out there and just dominate. I mean, there's not. 
too many people that mess around with mobile homes because of A, the stereotypes, and B, they don't understand the deal. So just like you, you said you've had maybe 10 of these hit your plate in the last year mm -hmm. that you walked on and it's because you didn't know how to structure the deal. By the time this deal, by the time this is done, you'll understand how to structure this deal. All right, and then uncomparable returns. And to be fair, for me, it's because I didn't want it bad enough. I could have figured this out if I'd wanted it bad enough. <laughs> so let's move forward. Let's see what happens here. So some essentials that we need to take into consideration here, and I'm going to go through some definitions and some history. Mobile homes built before June of 1976 are built to factory standard without regulation. And this is where a lot of the stereotypes on mobile homes are bred from, and that's because prior to 1976, HUD had no involvement with mobile homes whatsoever, and they were built by whoever wanted to build them to whatever standards they wanted to be built by. So like a Fleetwood home could have badass stuff done to it. And then, you know, a Clayton home could be an absolute pile of crap. And this is just throwing stuff out there. But there was no standards to say that if I buy a Clayton, it will be at least meet these standards. Right. So what happened is you had some really cheap manufacturers come sure. out prior to 1976 that were just putting together junk and you know really messing up some lives and since that happened hud stepped in in june of 1976 and hit what we're going to call hud regulations so any home built before 1976 is going to be called a mobile home anything past 1976 is called a manufactured home oh that's interesting so there's a difference in the definition there pre-76 is a mobile home post-76 is a manufactured home because when i get these calls i get a call no it's a manufactured home it's on piers that's i didn't know any different it has nothing to do with piers that's great um, so it's literally the exact same thing they're the exact same thing except for one is under hud regulation and the other one is not manufactured homes are regulated by hud mobile homes are not so 1976 is where that date starts. I like it. June of 1976. And it lets you church it up and call it a manufactured home. That's and the, the mobile, and I say, the community does not like the word mobile home. You know, they prefer to be called manufactured homes. If you go into a park, do not call it a mobile home park. The people in that front office may not like that terminology, although we are accustomed to hearing it and we understand that the world seems that it is synonymous. Uh, you will do better off calling them manufactured homes. Well, that's good enough. So, it, the intention is not to, I mean, obviously, you insult people without knowing it sometimes, but you're not, you're not wanting to do that. So, yeah, uh, and you may even realize that if you're in a park office and you call it a mobile home park, they may correct you. Definitely don't call it a trailer park. They don't like calling them trailer parks. Manufactured home. When I, I had assumed, you see it all the time on tax records, you'll see MHP. Mm -hmm. um, I'd assume it meant mobile home park but it probably means manufactured home park. It could be one or the other. It's, it's the industry as a whole gotcha. really would prefer to call it manufactured home. Like here in Texas, a great resource for you is going to be the Manufactured Housing Association. Uh, they offer a lot of wonderful paperwork. They offer you contracts. They offer you questionnaires. They offer you compliance review checklists. They offer you all kinds of great resources. So if you're in Texas, the Mobile Home Association of Texas, whatever it is, I'm pretty sure it's TMHA, Texas Mobile Home Association, offers a lot of valuable resources all right so moving on um, manufactured homes are factory built after June of 1976 to HUD manufacturing standards anything built pre 1976 mobile home post 1976 June of 1976 is going to be a HUD manufactured home and, and the big thing there is they had to meet some kind of minimum build standard yes which, which means some kind of code was involved whether it's electrical code ul listed parts exactly things that protect people that that changed the the dynamics of this industry uh, once the regulations started hitting our the installation standards of them and the manufacturing standards of them greatly increased so that was a very good thing for our industry all right and then we've got modular homes. Modular homes are totally different. Modular homes are factory built, delivered, and site assembled to local codes. So one of the biggest differences between a modular home and a manufactured home is a manufactured home is built to HUD standards. A modular home is built to local code. Hmm. Big difference. But, but it's still delivered. Still delivered. Sectionally. 
and assembled at the at the at the. Are, are they built on? Are modular homes built on steel beams? Like uh, I've never actually dealt with a modular oh. home, so I don't have the direct un the direct answer to that. But the biggest takeaway between that is a manufactured home is factory built to HUD standards. A modular home is factory built to local standards. Okay. okay? Makes sense. What's up? Y'all want to take a quick break? Uh, do we need to? I'll take, I need to, I'll take one. All right, everybody, All we're right. going to take a quick break. All right, quick uh, break. When we get right back, if, keep those questions coming, but uh, we're going to take a potty break. So questions, comments, bring them on. We'll see you in a little bit. lost my mind. Make sure Jason's still off. All right, so we're back here. So we are up to some of the basic definitions getting you in between what a modular home is a manufactured home or a mobile home are they're different and we need to know that mobile homes are built before june of 1976 manufactured homes are built after june of 1976 to hud standards and modular homes are built to built in factory to local codes so they're going to fall under your national electric code your, me your mechanical codes and your plumbing codes your you know building codes all those fun little codes all right, we're gonna wait for our co-host to come back, but I'm gonna open up the floor to some questions. If we've got any feedback or questions coming in from Facebook or YouTube, please remember this is a live class and I will be answering questions. Uh, Mary Daniels, uh, how do you fix them? Do you fix them yourself or do you find a contractor? What I have done historically is I have found more of a handyman. I, I try to find, you know, just kind of like, a one-stop shop, you know, kind of a chuck in a truck type of thing. Some guy that's got all of his basic handles and has a little bit of an understanding about all of it. And somebody that I can get to come on and do it for a very respectable cost. So that's who I normally use. Uh, Angel Bernal, in a single family residential, I have my notes serviced. Is this also an option to avoid self-service with mobile homes? Yes, you can definitely have somebody service your notes on these. These are going to be UCC security agreements backed by a prom note. But uh, so like if we're dealing with single family houses, uh, what is our what is our what is our collateral? What, not what is our collateral? What is our security instrument in the residential world? Our security instrument is going to be a deed of trust or a mortgage. That is our security to say if this person stops paying me, I can Take I can I can foreclose on this person. We're dealing with personal property. Personal property does not have deeds of trust. Deeds of trust are for real property. Personal property does not have mortgages. Mortgages are for, once again, real property. We will use UCC security agreements, Uniform Commercial Code security agreements, to perfect our interest in that collateral. And I'll discuss that even more here, but yes, you can have somebody service those notes for you. I mean, is it a reality that you can, I mean, because it's personal property, can you evict them out of there if they don't if they don't perform? Let's talk more about that as I'll we get, get to it. Bad. But it is not a foreclosure, and this might be a debate. And I'm not going to 
I'm not going to pretend like I'm the expert on it because I've only had to foreclose on one of mine. And I say foreclose, and that's the wrong term. I only had to uh, repossess because repossess is the proper. I get you. It's a repossession. It's I mean, I'm property. pushing in my mind. You hooking up to it with your truck and just driving off with them still inside it. But I my know you understanding, can't do that. my understanding is, outside of them still being in it, it is legal. <laughs> so. It's a repossession. It's not. It's not. It's not a foreclosure. It's a repossession. It's just like a car. If I stop paying paying notes on my car, which is personal property, they will come repossess it. Not much different in the mobile home world. Outside of a, I need to make sure it's very clear that my knowledge about it is limited to one transaction where I had to deal with some lawyers to get my property back. But it's a repossession, not a foreclosure, and it's called a friendly repossession. I cannot disturb the peace to repossess the property. So if they are home and they are out there screaming and yelling, I am disturbing the peace and I cannot repossess it. But if I am not disturbing the peace, I can pull up to it with a tractor trailer and yank that thing and go. So. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. You want to make sure nobody's inside it. Yeah, you can't. You can't. You can't just hook up to it with somebody inside of it. You'll be in a lot that's, of that's trouble. Kidnapping. But you can. And once again, this is predicated upon my limited experience. You need to talk to your own attorneys and everything yeah. else. It is a repossession, not a foreclosure. And with certain criteria met, I can hook up to it and yank it. I'm only laughing because I know some guys that would try that. They would that literally would get pull them into it a with lot a of trouble. And just took on to it. That would get them in some he trouble. He owes me my money. I I'm would going not to get do it. that. I would not do that. I think now is a perfect opportunity to, to remind everybody that we're not lawyers, we're not police, yes. we're not financial advisors, etc. Et all of my experiences in Texas. So your state may vary, it may change, but good question there, Angel, and we'll continue moving forward. So let's talk about looking at them. So this right here is, as you can see, it's a 1959 mobile home. Some of the things that I can tell you about this home that will immediately tell me, that will give me indications as to its age, it's 100% flat roof. Louvered windows. Very, very flat roof. All right, I'll go a little bit further on there. You see those slotted side horizontal windows that crank open? Very common of mobile homes built you know, in the 50s and 60s. Um, mobile homes were called skinny wides back then. Like They're normally like eight to a maximum of 12 foot. They're wow. really skinny. Very spacious. <laughs> yeah, they were. They were. They weren't very wide. So immediately, just looking at it, I've got that horizontal steel siding or aluminum siding. I've got the horizontal windows. I can see that it's skinnier and it's got that flat roof. Right off the bat, I'm thinking 50s. Right, right now, th 40s and 50s. All right. So those are some clear indications of the year, make, and model. And I want to know these things because. I probably don't want to invest in mobile homes. I want to invest in manufactured homes. I keep calling gotcha. them mobile homes, but I want those June so, 1976 houses. So you want after after 76? For me personally, yes. What I'm going to have to lean towards and say is don't use my standards for your own. Find out where your own comforts are. If I find a mobile home park that's got tons of those in them and people are living in them happily and paying rent, then it's an asset class I'm willing to invest in. Right. But if I've got one of those sitting in the middle of nowhere, and it's surrounded by a bunch of new manufactured homes, I might be a little wary about buying that, okay? So that one right there. That one is gonna be very typical for your, you know, 60s to 70s. I got a really slight curve to that roof, but not much at all. I've got what we call that little bump out there in the living room where the roof line jumps up. Mm -hmm. Very common of properties you'll find in the late 60s, early 70s. Do you also see the ones that are step ups, like the front end will be yep. higher? Yep, very common, 60s and 70s. So gotcha. if I'm pulling up on a property and I see a really slight curved roof on it like that, I see that bump up on there, I'm probably just pulling up to it thinking I'm probably dealing with a mid 60s, early 70s home. Okay, when 76 jumps in and the HUD takes, and HUD takes over, they start regulating the pitches on the roofs. Ah, they start forcing them to pitch. Um, so June 76, you'll start seeing a lot more curved roofs which just has looking dur at durability right it helps you shed water yeah. water is the enemy of every mobile home you'll ever find water penetration in mobile homes will destroy them fast obviously water getting into a house is not good but houses are typically built with studs plywood other materials that hold up a little better against water these things are often built with studs and particle board particle board gets wet it disappears I, yeah, I just want to throw in from the side because, you know, we're talking about water. Uh, water's the enemy to all real estate. I mean, <laughs> look at the Grand Canyon. Yeah. The Grand Canyon was made from water. Right. So regardless of whether you're looking at single family, commercial, big buildings, or just land. The, the difference for me on mobile homes, 
particle board. Is is the oh is the particle board, man? The particle board gets wet and like it will literally just the floor will fall out from under you. So that right there, mid 60s, maybe early 70s is what I'm going to think of pulling up to it. And that's going to immediately start giving me an understanding of what type of park I'm dealing with, what type of tenant base I'm dealing with, because it's already 2019 already. We're like a month and a half away from it. If somebody's living in a 60 year old mobile home and I've got a park that's full of 60 year old mobile homes, it's probably a different type of management. It's probably a different type of park. I gotta think what my tenant base is and what's going on there. That right there is an indication of what the of what that park will allow. I mean, there's probably some deferred maintenance too, like that yeah. little hole where there used to be a window unit that they just boarded up. Yep. So, all of that to say, would I buy that? I'm sorry. Go ahead. All of that to say, would I buy that? It all depends on the numbers. Right. So it's still less than eight thousand. I. Don't, I don't like being into them for more gotcha. than eight grand. You can start, if, if you're okay with making 50% on your money, which a lot of people are okay with making 50% on their money, you can go in there and spend 15 grand, 16 grand. It all depends upon what you want to see in your numbers. My underwriting criteria, criteria for a mobile home is I want to make at least 100% cash on cash. And I really prefer to be at 150% cash on cash. A lot of my deals are at the 180% range. Those are great returns, especially whenever you can be pretty much dead eight on these things in like six months. So we're good on that. All right, mid 60s, mid 70s, that'll give you an understanding of the construction standards. All right, that right there. It's a nice looking trailer. Yeah. Well, let's take a look real quick. Let's think about a few things here. And I want you to see how to analyze that. That right there right now looks pretty bad. But I would still buy it if it had a solid roof on it and I didn't have to re-roof it. And beyond that, the inside of the house was in a eh condition. So, so in my experience, the few that I've been through that are in this age, mm -hmm. age bracket almost always have flooring issues mm -hmm. because you can't, Soft. even just, even just the moisture in North Texas over time, that OSB degrades. Mm -hmm. um, I wish would, it was OSB, it's more, it's I'm, only particle. I'm MDF. sorry, particle board, yeah, yeah. yeah MDF. Would, would, would that preclude you from buying it? No, and I'll explain, I'll explain to you why not. So if I'm looking at that house right there, if I want to make the outside of that look good, it looks like I've got steel skirting on it. That might be fiberglass skirting, but it looks like steel skirting. If I just go in there and button up some of those gaps on that steel skirting, and I look around the outside of that property, and I'm not directly seeing anything that's constituting significant damage. It looks like I've got metal on metal. It looks like I've got a metal roof, metal siding, metal, metal uh, skirting. That is so easy to make look good, man. Like no joke for, yeah, for yeah. five gallons of paint. I could make that thing pop. So I could make that thing look real good. So if I'm looking at the outside, less than $1,000 to make the outside of that look good. Let's say I buy the unit for a grand. I'll put a thousand into the, and a grand's not outside of what I would pay for it. Like I've bought plenty of these things around that price point. I pay a grand for the unit. I pay a grand to clean up the outside. I'm into it for two. If I, my goal is to be into it for less than eight grand, I've got $6,000 to clean up the inside of that house with. So there's literally so I'm, I'm telling you all right now, I've been down, I've been down since I started this journey to 500 bucks in my, in my account twice. And mm -hmm. my wife was nice enough to keep that shit to herself. So I wasn't stressing about it. That's what you have an amazing partner will do for you. But there's no way I couldn't have found that $2,000 to take that down. No, there's no way you couldn't have found it. I mean, like, like you just go to a Quest IRA event or something like that. You'll find these people with IRAs. Show them the vision. Show them what you are going to do. Have them believe in your vision and your ability to execute upon it, and they will loan you the money. And, and this comes down to believing in your deals mm -hmm. and, and not, not believing in your deals. So um, you have to believe in it. You have, you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in yourself. And if you believe in yourself, you'll believe in the deals. And if you believe in the deals, you'll find the money. Right. So that right there is a deal I'd take down. So the difference between that one and this one is really nothing more than a basic coat of paint. Right. I mean, uh, like if you just picture that same that same well, paint. It's got the pitch roof, though. Yeah, but let's just talk about aesthetics. Yes. If I'm looking at nothing other than, man, man, that looks nice. I've got a little bit of landscaping done, and I just got a clean paint on that place. It doesn't cost me much to paint that place and clean it up. No. It does not. So don't let the look of it. I can find a handyman that probably paint the outside of that house for a grand. Oh, definitely. I was, I was normally paying about 800 bucks to paint uh, a single wide. Yeah, definitely. So a paint job would make that place look almost just like that. But if we're talking about year built, that curved roof and that pitch tells me probably pre-HUD, gotcha. probably pre-1976. That right there 
is probably, and once we start hitting 83, 83 starts becoming a little harder to give you telltale signs of when it was built. Because in 83, HUD forced a solid pitch. You will not find a home past 83, to the best of my knowledge, that does not have that very solid, prominent pitch to it. This one right here has a pitch, but it's more like a small curve. In 83, around about 83, uh, HUD started enforcing a solid pitch. Do we have any questions coming in? Yes, sir. Um, Justin uh, Dean was asking, what about the things inside? I think this is back when you're doing the repossession. Okay. Uh, so if we're talking about the repossession, what my understanding is, is, and this is not quotable, is I'm not allowed to keep anything of their, it, it's all detailed in the UCC security agreement. It will detail what I am and I am not allowed to do. Your state law will dictate that as well. My understanding of state law in Texas is I cannot keep any of their personal possessions. Um, what do you call those things? Um, I forget how, I can't keep their pictures of their family. I can't keep their, their clothes. I can't keep um, their work tools, <coughs> but their TVs, their computers, their furniture, I can keep all of that until I've been paid back. Now that is my understanding. You need to confirm that within your own lawyers and states. Yeah, because you need to know what, you need to talk to a lawyer about that because you need to know what to do with it after that or talk to somebody that knows. Because we'll talk that, more about that here. Oh, okay, yeah. that's what I was going to say. So we will go through the foreclosure or the repossession process of that here. But I need, just need to be very clear that I've only had to do it once. It was a very simple process when I did it. I didn't have to go through a bunch of legal on it. So my understanding of it is slim. But I've done enough research on it that I feel marginally confident in giving you an understanding that you need to confirm. One more question. John Sebastian Gonzalez, buying and reselling, do you need a special license or use a specialized agent? In Texas, you have to have what's called your RBI, Retailer Broker Installer License, if you want to sell more than one in a trailing 12-month period. Outside of Texas, I know most states have laws regulating the number that you can do. I think Ohio is something like five, but I don't know the laws you'll need to research in your own state. Uh, one more question. Uh, Andrew, you keep reiterating $8,000 total price. What backs up that metric? If I know, I could then slide that figure north or south given uh, for my area. Thanks. Everything for me is my cash on cash return. So I'm going to talk more about this here in a second. So I'm not going to delve into this deeply. I know at about $8,000 that I can probably A, get anywhere between a three to $5,000 down payment, which limits my exposed capital. If I get 3,000 down, I've only got 5,000 at risk. I'm okay with risking $5,000. I also know that most of the mobile homes that I, that I sell, I'll probably be able to pull anywhere between $800 to $1,200 a month in rent off of it. Included in that needs to be my lot rent. So if my lot rent is $350 to $400 bucks a month, and then I've got trash utilities and one or other two things, I, I'm looking to get my cash flow to me every month to be around $400 bucks a month. Okay. I might be able to get five, six, seven. I had one that I did I, almost $800 bucks a month in cash flow off of. Um, and but the further that eight grand goes up, the lower my cash on cash will go. Because even if I if, if I'm into that thing for fifty grand, I'm not going to be able to rent that thing for twenty or twenty eight hundred a month, or I'm not going to be able to rent that thing for thirty five hundred a month. I look at what I'm going to be able to rent it for, the amount of cash I'm going to be able to get, and I want my cash on cash to be over a hundred percent. That's where my eight grand's coming from. If you're okay with making fifty percent cash on cash, maybe you can go up to twelve grand, maybe you can go up to sixteen grand, but it's all broken down into the numbers. How much money am I going to have into it? How much money am I going to get back? And does that satisfy my need? So what's the, so I heard I've heard Danny Diaz talk about this. Uh, I've never corresponded with Corey really about it, but he, Danny Diaz talks about needing three hundred fifty dollars a month cash flow on a note, or he doesn't do it. I don't know what Grant's numbers are. You, you're saying Grant's you like, like two hundred? Okay, so you want to be, but they're, they're, that's not arbitrary numbers. That's 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 uh, their personal comfort. There is nothing I'm going to sit here and tell you is that you can't do nine thousand dollars on a deal. The one where I was making almost eight hundred bucks a month in cash flow was a unit that I was into for almost fourteen thousand. Right. But my cash on cash was still well over hundred percent because rents in that area said I could rent, I could sell that mobile home on a fourteen hundred dollar a month note because that's what mobile homes in that area were renting for because the school district was phenomenal. 
So when you're figuring that cash on cash return, that's fourteen hundred dollars a month minus the lot rent, right? Lot that's rent what on you that can was ask almost five hundred a month. Okay, so you can ask nine hundred for it. So I was getting about nine hundred a month Got in it. payments on that. I was getting a little over eight hundred a month in payments on that. Eight hundred a month in payments when I'm into a deal for fourteen grand and somebody gives me five down. I've only got let's say I'm just throwing numbers out there. I'm into Shoot. it for nine and I'm making eight hundred a month. It's going to be ten months, and bam. I'm, I'm cashed out of that deal. On an all cash deal. That's you putting in all your cash up front. Uh -huh. So, so, but cash flow has to come into play if, if somebody's borrowing that five thousand dollars from grandma. If I'm borrowing that money from grandma for 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 myself to acquire it, mm -hmm. I just need to take into consideration what my payments to grandma are going to be, and does the deal still make sense? Yes. And if you're if you're only into the deal for fourteen, and then I turn around and sell it on a forty five thousand dollar note. And I'm bringing in $800 a month off of that. I'm deal. I'm down for that deal. Right. So 8,000 is my general arbitrary number that I'm okay with because of the ter returns I want. But I still analyze every deal, every deal, and I look for that magic number, and that's cash on cash. Cash on cash is how I make my decisions. So that right there, uh, that right there is going to probably, in my eyes, be anywhere between mid to late 80s all the way up into the 2000s. I mean, that is a very common model. Some of the things that I like about that particular property is that it's got the metal siding. Metal siding does not look as good as the wood siding, right. as the laminate as the as the laminate exterior, but it's far more resilient and it's far easier to clean up. All I have to do is go through and squirt some paint on it and I'm good. If and, and they weren't using hardy board on those. That's no, not hardy board. No, they're using they're masonite. Using, right. They're using masonite, which Once it gets is water a maintenance it. nightmare. Yep. So that right there is an asset that I like because of the metal. What's up? What's masonite? Masonite is essentially particle board. It's MDF. It's just pressed sawdust that's glued together. Absolutely. And as water sits on it over time, that, that sawdust, the glue starts falling apart and it rots on you really quickly. If you want to waste twenty dollars, go down to a Home Depot and buy a nine-dollar sheet of particle board and a, a piece of masonite, and go outside and wet it down for a couple of days. Yeah, and it'll just it'll it'll fall it'll fall apart on you. So, although the masonite looks better when it's clean, it's like you said, it's a maintenance nightmare. It's a pain in the ass to maintain. So, if I buy them, I like the metal on metals. I've bought plenty of masonite ones, but I've learned the problems with them and to look them up front. And we'll talk more about that as we move if forward. You, if you ever want to know the difference, take out your pocket knife and try to push it through. It'll yeah. go into that particle board. It won't go through that hardy board. <laughs> Not at all. Hardy board, cement board. So, all right, um, keep on going. That right there. I'm going to lean towards is more than likely late 2000s. I've got some really nicer is. vinyl framed windows in there. I've got vinyl siding. I've got the vinyl skirting. I board. love that in its current condition. But as that vinyl siding gets older, and let's say that 2000 and something becomes a 25 year old unit, that the sun just beats that vinyl Ooh. up and it becomes brittle. It becomes sun, sun damaged. It starts looking bad over time. They look beautiful starting out, but over time, Buying them, they become a pain in the ass. Okay, just things. So would that about. keep you from buying it? Depends on the condition of the vinyl. All I know is that if I'm looking to own that, that vinyl siding over time is going to to screw up. Yeah, because what I typically see on vinyl siding, I saw this on a house I made an offer on Saturday, was a bunch of places where the lawnmower throwing rocks through it. Mm -hmm. It does it all the time. So it gets brittle under the sun. It gets it gets sun bleached. Uh, your colors aren't going to pop as well. If I get one and it's and this, it's just really sun bleached, I don't have a whole lot of problems with it. I'll just squirt some paint on it and call it a day. Uh, but you know, if I show up and it's real brittle, it's warping from the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, I might have to look at completely replacing it. Do I, am I going to go back and replace it with vinyl? Maybe yes, maybe no. More than likely, I'll go back and replace it with, with masonite. Gotcha. Just because masonite's going to be cheap, I could probably buy all the masonite I'd need for that for about twelve hundred bucks. And, and to be clear, while we were talking smack about masonite a minute ago, the difference is Daniel's going to paint that masonite mm -hmm. and make sure it's sealed up so it's not. Yeah. Subject so, to water damage. And it gives, yeah, with the masonite, you have to keep a good solid coat of paint on it to keep it sealed. Otherwise, it will destroy itself. So let's keep going. I hope I'm not boring y'all. I'm open to questions. Please keep, keep them coming. But let's go ahead and talk about HUD. 1976 of, was in the National Manufactured Housing Construction and Safety Standards was put into place. Circa 1983's home was manufactured with pitched roofs. Around 1994 is the implementation of Wind Zone 2. So we'll talk more about that here in a second, but once again, once we got the government involved, they started putting into place some regulations which for this industry we did need. And those regulations help control the safety of these units. 
um, it's easy for me to say that a home, you know, park, parked in Oregon is probably not going to get hit by a tornado anytime soon. Oregon's not well known for their tornadoes, but if I put one of these homes right here smack dab in the middle of Tornado Alley, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, I might want to put a little bit of restrictions on that property as far as how much wind it can take. Right. HUD realized that and in 1994 they implemented Wind Zone 2. 2000 they added Wind Zone 3. Tornadoes are bad and tornadoes can do a lot of damage, but you get a huge hurricane come in and that's a whole new level of story. So what you're gonna see is wind zone three encompasses most of the Gulf Coast and up the East Coast because they are known for taking hurricane damage. They're known for taking hurricane damage and homes built after 2000 installed in those areas need to have that taken into consideration. What I don't wanna do is I don't wanna be an investor that's working in a wind zone two area or a wind zone three area and installing wind zone one properties. Properties built before 1994 are grandfathered in. They have no wind zone classifications and they are grandfathered in. I can't kick, oh, I can't kick a 1993 out because it's in a wind zone two area. It was not regulated before then, they're grandfathered in. But if I'm an investor, I'm gonna be wise to it. And if I buy a 1996 and it's wind zone one, I'm not gonna allow it to be installed in a wind zone two. I will not allow it to be installed in wind zone three. So that's part of my due diligence looking at these units is what wind zone is it currently installed in and is it proper? Other things to look at is the roof load. If I am up in Michigan, I might want to be concerned about two foot of snow sitting on my roof. Right. A wind zone or excuse me, a, a roof load zone for Texas, we're not going to have two foot of snow on our roof. We have other problems. We have heat. We have those types of problems. So homes built for Texas will show you what area of the country that they're probably looking for and I'll show you how to find that out here in just a second all right and then in 2003 for Texas Texas investors Texas implemented the department Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs mobile home division TDHCA MHD great resource for research and finding out what Texas wants you to do I have read that entire website more than once great resource for learning about how to do mobile homes in Texas in regards to titling, transferring of titling, and just general cautionary things to consider as an investor in Texas. Great resource for you. For those that are in Texas, let's talk about TDHCA for just a moment. Prior to TDHCA, all of the titling was controlled through the Texas Department of Public Safety. Uh, the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles because they were considered cars. They were titled like cars and the DMV controlled all of that. When TDHC was implemented in 2003 though, they became their own division and they no longer have titles in Texas. Mobile homes do not have titles in Texas past 2003. They are called SOL. Why they call them SOLs, I could never know, but in after 2003, if you buy a mobile home, you're shit out of luck. They, they literally call them SOLs, short for statement, uh, statement of Ownership and Location. So, things to think about. Just throwing some thoughts processes for you out there. Are you gonna go into how many times you can move a mobile home? I personally have, am not fond of moving them. I do not want to move them because it messes up my cash on cash returns. If I owned a mobile home park or something like that, yeah, I'd move them. Um, I, from my recollection of the class, because my licensing class was like five years ago, they're really only intended to be moved one time. Beyond that is putting more stress on the, on, the, on, the, on the chassis than it was intended for. And every time you move one, you're opening yourself up to potential damage. My recollection was there's no stated number of times you're allowed mm -hmm. to move them, but really they're designed to be moved one time. Because I get told this all the time by people. They're like, oh yeah, you can't move them more than two times or you can't move them more than once. And it's usually a real estate agent that's telling me that. I know of no empirical data to prove mm -hmm. that. I think it would just be anecdotal. My understanding is yes, they're not made to be moved once a year. It causes a lot of stress on them. But beyond that, I don't think there is any hard facts that say anything. I would look to the manufacturer for that gotcha. answer. Um, so those are some things that you're gonna need to think about, some dates that you're gonna wanna consider. Um, so right here, remember how we were talking about wind zones and roof zones? We're gonna have right here, which is called the, this is the plate, the data plate. You're going to find the data plate located in the house, and we'll discuss that more in just a few more slides. But up here on the top left-hand corner, we're going to see the wind zone map. Can we discuss, too, what happens when they don't have the data plate? We will, because you can get a new one. Okay. Okay. 
So basic wind zone map in the top left hand corner. You can see zone one. You can see zone two that's kind of a little section there close to the, the, col the, 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 the gulf. And then you got wind zone three that kind of goes up the east coast and through the gulf. How many people have ever lived in Tornado Alley? I know I have. I live in Tornado Alley right now. What I do realize, though, is that Tornado Alley is still considered Zone 1. And for those of us living in Tornado Alley, we kind of feel like we're getting gypped here whenever we see Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas all still sitting in the same wind zone that they consider Nevada, Oregon, Washington, Idaho to be in. Right. So I've heard a lot of rumor that there might be a new wind zone reconfigured map that includes wind zone two or three up through Tornado Alley. So we might see that coming in the future, but as of right now, Tornado Alley is still considered zone one. <laughs> Why they do that, I don't know. It seems kind of crazy to me. So right below that, we've got the design roof load zone map. So they're looking at these areas in black to be areas of high snow loads, and they manufacture, if you look up there, uh, if you got north, middle, south, other. Well, north, middle, and south, 40 pounds per square foot is what the roof is allowed to accommodate up north. In the middle, we're looking at 30 pounds per square foot, and in the south, we're looking at 20 pounds per square foot. So they're just manufactured to handle a heavier roof load. All right, and then over here on the right side, this is kind of like the energy efficiency side of it. And like, if, if I'm in an area where my issue is keeping heat in, such as the north, I want a unit that's kind of helped design to keep heat in. In the south, our job is to keep heat out right. because we're baking in there. So we've got homes that are manufactured to different standards for different regions of the United States. And, and on first level, you'd think that's the same thing because it's you, you, we think about insulation like it's a cooler, yeah. but it's not. It's, it's, you, you need homes to breathe certain directions. You need them to accept heat in certain conditions. I'm glad you understood that. And it's a side tangent that I'll express to you real quick. On a house, you typically have your Tyvek on the outside, right. and then a lot of times you'll have an uh, insulation, insulation on the inside that still has its own vapor barrier on the front side of it. Homes, manufactured homes, if you put Tyvek on the outside of that thing, you will screw that house up. They, you, it's, just, it's just a side note, is if you put Tyvek on a mobile home, mobile homes are vented differently than a house. Do not put right. Tyvek on a, on a mobile home, just side tangent. Is it okay. just because it seals all the moisture in? Mm-hmm, okay. and you're trapping it in the wall. You're trapping the moisture into the wall. Yeah, and I mean, mobile homes don't have, or modular homes, or manufactured homes don't, I need to change my vernacular. Mm -hmm. they, don't have, they don't have the venting in the roof either that helps draft stuff that is built into every house. So, and, and it's just getting more and more every year. So if you put Tyvek on one, you will trap it. Gotcha. Don't, do, don't do it. So that right there is your data plate. Let's continue looking through. So mobile homes can be titled in one of two ways that I know of. Does it tell you, one real quick question, does it tell you on the data plate which, which zone you're, your trailer's built at? Yeah, it will tell you. So all of that information that's in there that's blank yeah, will so tell you what's going out. on. Yep. I get you. And at the bottom, it'll tell you exactly where you're at and what's going on for. Okay? So any questions coming in from Facebook before I move on? Facebook or YouTube? Uh, it's hard for me to imagine I'm dropping this much knowledge and people don't have questions, but it's all good. There's a lot of <laughs> questions. All right. So I know you're just being nervous right now. Uh, <laughs> Angel is asking, in single family after five to six, we're needing an RMLO to handle our buyers uh, Ooh, on questions. notes created. Is that similar to mobile homes or is this not needed? Good questions. Bernal's dropping, dropping Good bomb. questions. That is a question that I'm going to leave the answer up to you on. Um, that right there is just a question I'll have to leave it up to you. I've heard both sides of the story. I am leaning towards yes. By the letter of the law, yes, I should have an RMLO on it. And that's where I'm going to leave it. I will also say that of all the ones I've done, I've never used an RMLO. Um, that's not saying that I'm doing it right, uh, but I am doing it ethically. Um, I am not screwing people over. I'm not going through doing those types of things. But no, I personally do not use an RMLO. Yes, I personally think you should. Antonio Hernandez, uh, just wanted to give him a shout out real quick. Thanks for watching and also sharing it to many people. Uh, he was just saying there's a lot more to picking up mobile homes on the cheap. Yeah. He um, said, wow, than that. Yeah. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig in deep on this, man. I told you, this is going to be a two to three hour class. Does he mean that he's surprised there's a lot more? I don't know. I just think he's like, you know, I think the most people would think, oh, mobile home, going back to the very first slide of, 
of the uh, um, you know stereotypes, whatever. It's just like anything you don't know. I, I, I think basically what he's saying is that there's a lot more to it than oh. he, than he anticipated. For right. sure. So like I, and I Maria, really she was just saying soaking all in. That's all. Uh, somebody did ask, what's an RMLO? Red, uh, residential mortgage loan originator. They will help you maintain compliance with Dodd Frank. They will help you just put all the paperwork you need together. So to put together. So if you jump in front of a judge, you are still in that QM range, that you qualified mortgage range that you're going to want to be in. On my side, honestly, though, I run my business ethically. I'm not going to put myself in a position where I'm going to jeopardize something. Let's just so let's look at the RMLO statement. I'm going to drop it from there. I'm not going to discuss it any further. If I underwrite a property myself and I've got fantastic cash on cash returns, let's say up front I get a $5,000 down payment and whatever, if that deal starts going so far south on me a year and a half into it that it's causing me a headache, I've already got all of my money back. Quite literally, I could just say, you know what, it's not worth my headache, keep the house done, walk away from it. It's just a matter of how much do you want to fight? You know, once I'm cleared of my own cash, my risk is done. And if I'm two years into a loan and that loan's going south and they're starting to become a fight about it, and I'm sitting here thinking, you know what? Does this really worth my brain power to deal with this right now? I could quite literally say, you know what? Here's your release of lien, have a good day. I'm, you know, Merry Christmas, done. I could walk away from it. There's nothing that says you have to fight. So I run my business ethically and I try to make sure people are done right. Uh, going back to the how many times you can move it, uh, Justin Brashear uh, from YouTube, in the oil field we drag mobile homes up and down these roads a lot, <laughs> usually about six or more times a year. It is hard on them, but I have been impressed with how well they actually hold up. See, so there's some good there's some good evidence right there, man. Roughneck is doing it good. So, all right, moving on. Dragging the bunkhouse. <laughs> it really is. So this is going to be a piece that I have to drill in hard. And that is real versus personal property because a mobile home can be res real property or it can be personal property. It can be either one and you need to know the difference between the two. It is very important. Personal property, personal property. Personal property has a title issued from the DMV or D you know, wherever the issuing authority comes from, it will have a title. And I don't want to confuse title to the deed. A deed is different. A lot of times we call it the title. You know, do you have title to your property? Deed. Deed is what gives you ownership of real property. Title is what gives you ownership of personal property. Title versus an SOL. Personal property will have a title. It will be taxed as personal property. It will be taxed by your local agency as a personal property. And the land and mobile home are considered separate on paper. They're not necessarily separate. You know, they could, a mobile home that's personal property can be attached to the land physically and through title attached separately. Ask questions. So once it's elected real, does it still have a title on it? No, at least in Texas. I can't speak for everybody else, and man, my hip is killing and, me. And if you have a question whether it's elected real or not, it's usually on the tax, the tax website for the county assessor's office. But you can always just call the assessor's office and ask them. I also do my research through the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. They have a title research. Um, and we'll go, we'll, maybe we'll even be able to go through that here live. But they have a title research section on their, on their website that will allow you to input a, a um, plate number and immediately get all of the information that Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs knows about that property. I love the title plant research that you can get out of personal property on, on Texas. So, stop. Say hi to Turkey Bear. Hey, Tyler. Mm -hmm. Tyler, how you doing? So my kiddo, my kiddo watches here live and she always enjoys whenever, whenever we get to say hi to her. So hi, Tyler, nice seeing you. All right, um, so the land and mobile home are separate, okay? You got that? Understood. Okay, um, real property, it has a deed. And in that deed, the mobile home will be referenced, okay? Um, in Texas, I, do, I have not converted anything to real property in Texas. I've always done these as personal property, so I have not gone through that yet, but my understanding from what I was taught in my licensing class is whenever I take it to title, the title company has essentially a single form sheet of paper that says this mobile home, this manufacturer serial number, et cetera, et cetera, is being transferred over to real property. 
Texas Department of Housing and Community Fair basically writes that SOL off as abandoned, not abandoned, but as transferred to real property, and the the asset is supposed to be mentioned in the deed. So I can't go further than that because I don't have the experience to. But Can you unelect them as real property? Yes. My understanding is you can unelect them as real property, but I too have not done that. Okay. It's taxed as real property. You'll show it, see it on the tax rolls as real property, and the land and mobile home are both titled on the same document. Okay, I cannot get title to land as personal property. It's not personal property, but I can get title to a mobile home as real property. So that's a, another really good clue you just gave you there when you're doing your title, when you're doing your, your research. Um, in my county, if it's not elected real, there will be a tax record for the property and a tax record for the the, tra the manu manufactured home. So great point. So that's why that's why I bring the taxes up. So if you're trying to decide if it's taxed as real or personal property, look it up in your tax records, and it should give you an indication. Beyond that, you should be able to do some at least in Texas title research. Texas is the only state that I know of that allows open open records on the ownership of mobile homes. Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs just knocks it out of the park. Okay? What's up? Justin Dean, I bought an old home in a park on a note last year as a real property sticker, has a real property sticker on it. This means the park holds deed until I finish my note, but with a house, I'd get my name on that deed like the house I bought on a private note. Should I have the deed to my mobile already? There is several things to look at there, several things to consider there. I've heard some terminology being thrown around that I don't think is correct. Um, if it is in a park, it is not real property. It should not have any, I've, I know of no stickers on a mobile home that indicate real property. If you're talking about that data plate, that is going to be from the HUD, from the HUD manufacturing data plate. Going further into that, if you bought it on a note from the park, as far as personal property goes, I don't think there are any regulations that I can think of that say how they are required to structure that transaction. If that was a house, they could not do what they have done, if I've heard you correctly, but it being a personal property, you are probably in some sort of rent to own scenario and without knowing everything about your scenario, I can't give any answers to it other than if you do have a rent to own scenario, make sure you understand your paperwork, make sure that it is all being done properly and there may still be regulations that handle that and I just, I, I can't give much advice beyond that without a serious conversation. Yeah, I mean, one question would be, is he getting the lot with it? Because there are some parks that'll sell off random lots, okay. even though they own everything around it. I got asked to leave one the other day when I was trying to buy it. And wow. It, well, it is what it is. So, the lady in the office was surly. She was, mm -hmm. she was a rough customer. <laughs> but so, th I know they sold off individuals. I, yeah, I really can't answer that on any level without massive amounts of detail. Uh, Angel Bernal, uh, first of all, Angel, thank you so much for asking so many questions. Uh, upon transferring into real property so you can increase so you see an increase in taxes at all or does typically remain the same I've never transferred one to real property I've done all of my deals as personal property so I do not have the answer to that either uh, one of the things you will see for me is whenever I know something I'll say it whenever I don't know something I'll say it you're not going to hear me try and come some fake guru that's talking about stuff he doesn't know I'll tell you the truth on what I do and what I do not know uh, what I do know is personal property I understand personal property on mobile homes quite well. Uh, a follow-up for Justin. I think they lost the title. That's why they did the real property. It's all owner finance. I think the park manager is an idiot. I pay lot rent plus I don't know where weird situation. You from the details I have gathered from you is you are in a weird situation. Um, a lost title uh, means you may have bought it from somebody that doesn't even own it. Uh, you need to find out who owns that. Uh, there's going. You know, I, watch this entire class, and as we get further into this, I'm going to teach you how to do to title research, at least here in Texas. And through title research, you should be able to find out who at least is in title on your home, and then start create some some scenarios to fix that. But I cannot address that right now. That is a very detailed question. Uh, one more, and then we'll be caught up. Uh, Jeremiah, is personal property taxes less than real property? I'm going to assume yes, because my manufactured homes that I've had to pay taxes on are normally anywhere between $300 to $200 a year, uh, or between $30 and $200 a year, so not much. 
that's pretty good. Yeah, so I, I seriously think your real property is going to come with a lot more taxes attached to it. So what to look for in mobile homes? You're going to need to verify whenever you're going to do your due diligence on these. Are they titled as personal or real property? Very important part of your due diligence. Um, you're going to need to figure out that the unit itself has demand in your local market. Bed, bath configuration meets local demand. If I have somebody offer me an eight wide by 45 long that's a one bed, one bath, and everything in my market is a three bed, two bath, 14 by 80, then I might still buy it, but I need to understand that I'm not gonna be able to pull the rents, my days on market might need to be longer. It might take a little bit more for me to sell that thing and I might not get as much as I want to for it. So that same unit though, in a different part of this country, maybe in the oil field, might work just fine for me. So you need to make sure that there's demand for the product that you're buying. Um, I always look for the flat versus curved or pitched roof. I personally prefer pitched roof. I have bought a handful of curved ones. I've never bought a flat one. Have you converted any of them? Uh, they do have roof overs you can do, and I haven't done them. I, you see it all the time yep. on the sticks, man. They stick up poles all the way around yep. the trailer. Basically build a pole barn around the yeah. house. Uh, yeah, you can do it. I haven't, you know, I haven't done it myself. Uh, the roofing material, um, if you do go and you're looking at these, I like the metal on metal units. I like the metal exterior, the metal roofs. It just makes it easier for me to maintain. If the roof has a little bit of an issue, just get up there with a the tar roller, just roll some tar out there. It's that silver stuff. Right. Uh, and you just get up there and just roll on and seal that roof up again. Uh, whereas if it's a composition shingle, uh, you can, you're, you're going to have to re-roof it. Now, there's quite a few things that I'm just going to disclose right here, right now, that you need to be paying attention to on buying a composition roof. Um, part one is if you need to put a new roof on it, you cannot lay it over. You cannot put two layers of shingles on a mobile home roof. You can put two layers of shingles on a single family home per code. On a manufactured home, the roofs are not built for that kind of weight and you cannot do it. Step two is if you have to replace decking on those things. Uh, the decking is not any better of a material than any of the rest of the house. Uh, the trusses that build the, that build out those roofs are often two by two trusses. They're not two by four at all. They're two by two, and it does not take much weight on that roof to start snapping them. So if you're staging shingles on that roof, most especially the damn peak, you will destroy the roof of that house. Steel, I mean, steel roofs are a lot, lot lighter than composite too, right? Uh, the, the, they're actually aluminum, I believe. They may, they may be steel. I didn't know. I was but, assuming you were talking yeah. about like galvanized or something. Yeah, the gal whatever they are. The, they're, they're basically rolled steel and they just seal them. Yeah. Um, the biggest point I want to take away is do not approach that composition roof as you would a traditional single family home. No more than one layer on there. They are two by two trusses. You need to distribute the weight on that roof very evenly. If you start loading all your shingles up onto that roof and stick them in a pile, you will collapse the roof. Be very careful what you do on the roofs of those houses. Okay, uh, the size in the home, width and length, we've already discussed that. Make sure that it meets the demand in the, neighbor, in the neighborhood that you're gonna be able to sell it. Other things that I like to look for on mobile homes is what type of plumbing is located in these things. They're, a lot of times you'll have PEX. PEX is like a, a uh, semi-flexible um, PVC conduit. It, 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 that's a horrible way to describe it, but it's a fairly flexible hose, but it's got some rigidity to it. You're not going to be able to just draw figure eights with the thing. But it's super durable too. This yeah. is not the same old, uh, or the, it's not the stuff they tried to convert to 20 years ago. PEX Quest. is the new standard. Yeah. Quest is the shit that they used, tried to use 20 years ago. It's gray. It's brittle, it breaks a lot, it's crap, it causes problems. Um, but Quest is very common in the early 80s all the way up into the 90s. Very common material you'll find. Just know that when you go to working on it, it's brittle. The more you touch it, the more leaks will pop up and you gotta be careful with it. Uh, a lot of the times the damage done to the floors is going to be caused by Quest leaking underneath mm. the kitchen cabinets, in the, by the commode, underneath your sinks, by the water, hot water heater. Um, a lot of times, Quest is going to be the origin of that problem. Uh, it's easy to fix, though. You just get underneath it, cut it, splice it, put it back together, or replace it. It's not a difficult thing to replace or fix. You just got to be aware of it. If you're walking, so this was a, a lesson that I learned. I was walking through one house one time, and I had a bunch of random soft spots in the floor all throughout the house. 
uh, soft spots or indication of water penetration somewhere, but I saw no source for the water to come from. It wasn't near an AC closet, it wasn't near any other source of water, but there were soft spots in the floor. What had happened was the pecs underneath the house uh, had been shifted around so much because the water hose, someone tried to do their homemade water hose connection and just went in there and tapped into it, but they never secured any of the fittings. So every time they messed with the water hose, it just shook the whole Quest trunk. But even just turning stuff on and off rattles those lines every time. It does. It got so brittle that underneath the house I had little pinhole cracks mm. all through my Quest and those are just spraying up and hitting the floor. So I had to completely replumb that entire property. I had to go through the belly of it. So I don't know if I have that on here. I'm gonna go ahead and throw that on here as what, something else to look for is when you're buying one, always pull back the skirting and look underneath that house. Look for moisture being trapped underneath the home as well as the condition of the belly. And what I mean by the condition of the belly is underneath that house, there's gonna be normally like a black tarp that encompasses the entire under, under part of that home. That gives you um, insulation from the elements because all of that plumbing should be up above it. Mm -hmm. But what else it does is it will give you indication of problems. If you look under there and it's all sagging real low, it might be filled up with water. You need to be aware of that. If you see that somebody's cut it all open, there might be other issues you need to think about. Just always take the time to look underneath that home. Yeah, so, I mean, I've seen that. It's just shredded under there where the homeowner's been under there, just pocket knife, doing mm -hmm. maintenance, whatever they're doing. You just um, need to be aware of what's going on under there. Do you have to fix that when you see that? Technically, you should get under there and tape it back up. Uh, that is a vapor barrier, gotcha. one. And then two, it is, it is the insulation protecting your, your plumbing from the elements. Uh, that, that belly should be sealed up. So it keeps, it keeps the moisture from evaporating coming through the bottom of the floor. It, it keeps the moisture gotcha. coming up through the bottom of the floor and it also keeps the, the cold weather away from your piping. So we need to look at the belly. Other thing I always like to look for is the siding type, metal, vinyl, or panel board. I prefer metal homes. It's just so much easier to clean them up. Although I've bought plenty of panel boards and I found a different way of cleaning those up that I'll discuss here in a little bit. Okay, where do I find these deals? Where am I finding these mobile home deals? Classifieds, anywhere you can find classifieds. You've got mobile apps out there now, you've got Let Go, you've got Offer Up, you've got Facebook Marketplace, you've got, you've got Thrifty Nickel, Green Sheet, Classifieds, you've got Craigslist, all of them. Just look for them and set up some tools to help you find those. I asked for a thrifty nickel in a store the other day and the girl looked at me like I was crazy. Like nobody <laughs> knows what they are anymore. Uh, they're, it's getting dated, but if you can find them, that's where older people are probably gonna look to put their homes. They're not gonna go to offer up or let go or Facebook. Well, there's a reason, right? A lot of times it can be almost free to put an ad in those. Right. If you're selling something, because they get they get turned or other ways, but it costs money to put them in a paper. You're right. paying them by the word. So yeah. old people that are on a limited budget put stuff in certain places for a reason. So keep an eye out for it. Look for all of those things. And I'm not saying look for all those things like once a week, go out and look at it. You look at it when you wake up in the morning. You look at it when you go to lunch. You look at it before you go to dinner. You look at it before you go to bed. You're constantly keeping an eye on those things. There are some tools that'll help you set up alerts for them. Some, some applications will allow you to set up your own alerts but if you're working on craigslist there's apps you can get for your phone that'll allow you to put save searches and get alerts on your phone so um, there's several different search terms that i'll put together mobile home is one of them mobile homes is another one uh, manufactured home trailer home but you need to find the plural and the non-plural of both uh, but just go out and do your research and set up some searches and that is Craigslist alert notifications on my phone is how I got my start between that and driving for dollars in parks was how I got my start on mobile homes and then once I started building reputations within parks most of all of my deals started coming from park managers. Bandit signs, uh, bulletin boards at parks. Bandit signs work extremely well on the mobile home side of it, but make sure your bandit signs say, we buy mobile homes. Uh, what happens is you start seeing these mobile home owners that live in these parks getting stressed out because they see these we buy houses signs and they start calling them up and they're like, hey, I've got a mobile home for sale and they get hung up on. Hey, I got a mobile home for sale they get hung up on. And then they start calling them, hey, I got a home for sale. And they get the investor to show up and as soon as the investor shows up and sees that it's a mobile home, they're like, see you later, I'm done. So they start becoming, that they, they start getting an idea in their head that they can't sell these houses to an investor. 
So if you put up bandit signs in your mobile home parks that specifically say we buy mobile homes, you'll see your call volume tick up. So start finding mobile home parks you want to invest in and drop bandit signs around them. Bulletin boards, um, bulletin boards, bulletin boards, haha. -ha. Uh, bulletin boards at parks. <laughs> <laughs> it just is. I, I'm seeing some, some stuff here, but uh, bulletin boards at parks. Um, you need to be okay. you need to make sure that your park manager is okay with you doing this. Uh, if you're going into a park and your park manager is in competition with you, you might as well just accept that you're not going to do business in that park. But if you approach the park manager and be like, "Hey, I like to purchase mobile homes, fix them up to the park standards, and then resell them," if you're okay with that, you know, do you mind if I put a little sign on your on your community board saying I'd like to buy some homes? If you get a yes, go do it. If you don't get a yes, just understand that if you do it, you might piss off the park manager and the park manager is who controls your life. <laughs> yeah, that's, and, and, and I mean, that's ultimately the person that when you go to renew your lot rent, they could be like, oh yeah, it's $800 mm -hmm. this month. And your choice is then to move it out of the park or figure out how to pay the $800. Yep, and that's, that is a nasty realization to this side of it, is the park manager is your biggest win or loss. So you need to create those relationships, build them up, and and just cultivate them. Because without them, your business is gonna just is gonna is gonna suffer. So it's not it's not in the same. Well, it is in the same vein. Bulletin boards at Walmart. Yeah, anywhere. Any any place you can put them, not just at the parks. I just want to throw that out there. Anywhere yeah, you can put up a sign. Even. Uh, We'll go, we'll, go, we'll go through that on the sale part of it. The sales aspect of it, I like putting them at your local apartment complexes because your apartment people are the people that I'm probably selling my homes to a lot of the times. Driving for dollars, go map out and find all the mobile home parks in your area, go drive them. While you're driving them, look for homes that look like they've either been abandoned or have signs in their windows saying for sale. You'll find a lot of homes that'll just have a little for sale sign in the front window of the, of the, of the unit. It ain't real hard. I mean, mobile home parks stick out like a sore thumb on Google Maps. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to find them because uh, as humans, we see patterns and they're a pattern. They're always laid out. Boom, easy to find. Well, yes, sir. Uh, just because you're on that topic, uh, you know, I, I had a quick question on that. You talk about just drive for dollars for the mobile home parks, but like, you know, I understand abundancy versus scarcity. Like when you have so many people trying to do this business, how how do you even compete when you know that all the all the mobile parks in DFW and the Metroplex, Daniel Moore's hitting it up, and all the mobile home parks outside the Metroplex, Corey Thompson's hitting up. What and anything in between, Jason Witherspoon's hitting up. I say consistency. Consistency is going to be the thing that very few people are able to pull off. Uh, you may have a lot of people try, but you know there's going to be people that come out and do one, that do none, that do three or four, and say, you know what, this is more work than I can handle. It's the people that do it consistency that win, that consistently win in developing relationships. But probably 90% of the people that watch this video today aren't going to act on it. So while you're sitting there saying all, all, all thousand people that are watching this or 10,000 people that see this video are going to are gonna act on it, they're not. They're going to they're gonna explain that away and the small percentage is actually going to take action. They'll, they'll overcomplicate it. There's, there's a lot of thought processes behind that, but ultimately the only competition you have is yourself. Right. And if you, if you, you just got to get through yourself because I see people who enter, enter this industry with the competitive level that we're at right now and just dominate. And I see others that come in and fail. I think the, the difference is the person themselves and their, their dedication to their why. So talking to park managers is going to be inevitably probably your best source long term is building strong relationships with park managers. You know, go through, meet with that park manager up front and just say, hey, you know what? I would love to buy any mobile homes that you have in your community, any manufactured homes that you have in your community that don't meet your standards that you would like um, to, you know, to have them see revitalized. I'll come in, I'll purchase them, I'll bring them up to your standards, and I'll turn around and sell them to a to a to an owner that you approve. You know, because something they don't want to do is. Park manage, parks get their money by renting the lot. Sometimes they do it through rentals. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I prefer owner-occupied parks over rental parks. It's a better tenant base in my opinion. But the owner-occupied parks... Um, well, they get skin in the game. They get something to lose. The park, I, I like that because they tend to keep a better control of the, over their units. But a park that will allow me to come in there and sell it to somebody, they, they don't want to lose that trailer. 
If they lose that trailer, they lose their revenue. It's not making them any revenue right now because it's just sitting there not getting any lot rent paid on it. But some mobile home park managers don't have the money to, to maintain their own park. It's, it's a reality. But if I go in there and say, hey, you've got that vacant home over there. Can I buy it from you? And if I buy it from you, we'll set it up and bring it up to your standards that you like. We'll work through finding a owner that is going to be a good fit for your park. You know, I'm not going to sell it to somebody that doesn't meet the criteria that you have met for your own park. And I'll make sure that it stays there so you can collect lot rent from it. Does that sound like a deal that you'd be interested in? And if they're like, you know, no, you're in, comp you're in competition with me. Have a good day. Walk down the road. But if they're like, well, tell me a little bit more. We'll sit down and if they're, you know, just help them understand your vision of like, it, it looks bad right now, it's vacant, it's causing problems. How about I go over there, fix it up, make it look nice, make it look like, you know, what you would want to see in this park and let's just move on down the road. If you can find park managers that will allow you to do that, build that relationship. You know, you've already met her, you've already introduced her. Let's say you weren't able to buy that one home. But give her a call over a couple of weeks or give him a call over a couple of weeks and say, hey, you know, I met you a couple of weeks ago. I was just wanting to see if anything else has changed. If you've seen any other homes come up or if you've seen, any, you know, of any of your tenants that are looking to sell, can I, can I, can I, can I be a resource for you to sell them to? And start looking for word of mouth marketing from, from park managers. It, it'll help. So, so what you, you're giving that park manager is the, in yourself in a sense, is you're offering a partnership. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, what the reality is. So if they've got 20 homes in there that are derelict and falling apart, and you can come in and start increasing their monthly revenue by mm -hmm. getting them the, the lot rent back, you may not want to point out that they haven't had enough money to spend on their CapEx and fix the roads or fix anything else. But hey, you know what, if we're going to help fix up these parks, that's where it's ultimately going to come back to because that affects them being able to take care of that park as a whole. And here's the path that this will inevitably lead to, is if you get into one of those little mom and pop mobile home parks, you know, 20 park, 20, 20 unit park, 30 unit park, 10 unit park, this will inevitably be the course that you're probably going to end up following is if you get into one of those and you fix up unit one, and then they send you to unit number two and you start fixing it up and you're doing the business that you told them, you're running it ethically, you're running it as you, in, as you told them you would. The conversation will almost always get brought up either by you or by them. Would you just consider selling me the entire park, owner financed? And then boom, you've already created the partnership and they've seen the trust in you and they say, well, what would you give me for it? Well, right now you're only making 900 bucks a month by the time everything's said and done with off of this every month what if i could and you're still having to deal with all the headache what if i could give you let's say a thousand dollars a month for the next 15 years or whatever it ends up being and i i then own it well you're you're knowing that it's only making 900 a month right now but you know that if you come in and you clean all these units up do some maintenance on the road get rid of some of the deferred maintenance you can now be bringing in four thousand a month off of this little park. Do you, when you, when you offer that to them, so you know that the, the carrot there is here's a thousand bucks, here's an extra hundred dollars a month and you don't have to do any work. Mm -hmm. Are you throwing in their lot rent with them or are you making them pay you lot rent back? Because well, if it's a park manager um, that's living on site, I'll tailor the deal to make sense to me and them. Gotcha. Uh, whatever it ends up needing to be, I'll get that dialogue open. And that's what I'm trying to say is that when you start doing these personal properties in parks, you get into some parks where you've got a mom and pop that's just been holding on to it for 20 years and that's been their only sole source of revenue, but they're tired of dealing with it, they're cash strapped, and they're, they're looking to retire and get done with it, but they can't because they're tied on to this thing. You give them an opportunity to let go of it, go on about their retirement and collect a little bit of money every single month from it anyways, you're gonna see opportunities open up to make that happen. So I don't know if everybody caught the nugget that just dropped here that Daniel threw in, but he, he said it multiple times and he, he keeps saying owner occupied. You'll hear Corey talk about it as tired landlords. That's what you're looking for. If they're an offsite manager, they're not encumbered. They're not having to deal with the meth heads that live in trailer five. They're not having to deal with the, the 27 pit bulls that are tied outside trailer six. That owner occupied person is, is rife. They're, they're ready to do a deal with somebody that can bring value to them. It just made me laugh because I, I bought a park like that one time. As soon as you said, pit bulls tied up. I had oh, one yeah. guy. You get a little, when you see multiple pit bulls, <laughs> when you, when you got good. pit bulls and there's literally no grass and a circumference around them, you know them, that bull's been tied there for a long time. And it's sad, man. It that, is. Those dogs, every one of those dogs had to be put down. It just, there was no relationship there. They were just so rabid dogs. We've had that neighbor before. My parents have had that neighbor. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just dogs tied on stakes. Mm -hmm. County can't do nothing about it. 
SPCA won't come do nothing about it because it's in the county. It's a terrible situation. It so is. sorry. Uh, so to, for the did we have something pop up? It looked like we did. Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, we consistently have good stuff pop up because <laughs> you're y'all are just dropping stuff. Keep going, uh, Angel. This goes back to earlier, but Angel is asking uh, any benefits to transferring into real property that you might have heard of, or is it better to leave it as is? From my side, the only thing I could I could picture being good for me transferring it to real property on is just creating more notes with land. Like if I have raw land, at, at, let's just say I have 10 acres of raw land. 10 acres is a magic number here in Texas because I can pop off a gun on it. 10 acres means I can shoot my guns <laughs> and I have a little bit of land for it. If I find it's only if you want to be legal. Yeah. Like everybody, like I can <laughs> legally pop off a gun on 10 acres, but if I've got 10 acres <laughs> and I can go out and find myself a mobile home for five grand, let's say that 10 acres as is is only worth 25,000. The second I put a mobile home on there that's occupiable and decent, it's got a septic system, water, I could probably turn around and sell that $25,000 land for eighty dollars to $100,000. That is where I'd probably start looking to convert personal property to real property. And beyond that, you know, I, I don't do it. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm the guy that does them on. I feel, on. I feel like you need to do a PSA about the 10-acre rule because I know a lot of rednecks <laughs> that don't follow that. They're PSA just, is if it's less than 10 acres, you can't squeeze the trigger. If it's more than 10 acres, you can squeeze the trigger in Texas. My understanding is as long as it's outside of city limits. What's up? Uh, Jeremiah, if you need to replace r the roof and it's shingles, can you replace it with a metal roof? If so, is it worth the price-wise? My understanding is yes. My response back to the price is probably not unless you're the owner occupied. Uh, the metal roof is going to cost you more than the shingle and your goal on this is cash on cash returns for low income affordable housing that is safe, clean and affordable. That's all there is to it. And one more for right now, uh, and I second this from when I was doing marketing, but Paul Shaw, I get a crazy amount of mobile homes from cold callers, but I don't do anything with them yet. All right. Well, by This the goes back to the abundancy and all that. By the end of this, I hope you have a better understanding of it. And a lot of what I'm explaining to you can be finagled into real property because uh, you can still have that $25,000 worth of 10 acre land and slap a mobile home on it. And that mobile home does not have to be real property. It does not have to be real property. So I can, I can work different scenarios out in my own head. The possibilities are limitless. You just have to explore and open your mind to what they are. In this, I actually second this question from Joel just because, uh, you know, so many acronyms get thrown around. Uh, when you're saying PSA, public service announcement. Right. I agree. So, Joel, I, I'm, I'm all for asking that. All right. Uh, so, park managers, in my opinion, are going to be your number one resource for everything you do in this business. You'll get started out with everything else, but if you're doing this business well, by the time you get to, par to, uh, to park managers, that resource will be your number one option. So you build and cultivate those relationships, have a list of 35, 40 park managers that you're constantly hitting up you know, bi-weekly. Uh, for the ones that you really feel like you've got a chance at building a relationship with, stop in, bring them a pack of Marlboros, bring them a, you know, some Dunkin' Donuts, <laughs> just Marlboro. do something. I'm not joking, the reason I say a pack of Marlboros is because when I had a park manager and every time I saw her, she was puffing on a Marlboro. So when I showed up, I brought three. I brought three packs with me. I was like, "Hey, here you go." I'm only laughing because you pronounce Marlboro right, not <laughs> like Marlboro, like some people do. Uh, it's either Marlboros or Salem Lights. It's one of those two, guaranteed. So, but just think about that. I mean, like, I know that she smokes quite a bit. Every time I see her, she's smoking. There's a whole ashtray next to her full of you know cigarettes. Smells like cigarette smoke in the office. Boom, bring her some cigarettes. She'll love you for it. And the next time you call her and you say, hey, you got anybody? She'll be like, she might be like, yeah. $60 a carton. That's a, that's a good payday. Do it. That 60 bucks might buy you a mobile home. So do it. Talking to park managers will make it happen. Repo lots, banks, mobile home movers. Mobile home movers um, you know, might be hit or miss for you. But you get in touch with some mobile home movers, they might have access to homes that are no longer wanted. You get in touch with repo lots. You'll get access to homes that somebody else didn't want. Banks might have mobile homes sitting on their inventory that they haven't been able to get loaded off. Talk with all of them. Find out what works. A good resource that might work out for you between mobile home movers and park managers is park managers have vacant lots that they want filled. Mobile home movers have houses that they need to find some place to put and or sell or get rid of or whatever. Well, if I can get those mobile home movers to call me up and be like, hey, I'm picking up a 1989 single wide needs a little bit of work, but I'm picking it up next week. Do you want it? 
And he's like, well, maybe I'll sell it to you for two grand if I don't have to take it off my truck. You know, $2,000, I'll, I'll give it to you and I'll take it to wherever you want to go. And install it. And, you know, I'll, I'll drive it over there and set it where it needs to be nice. and install it. Well, then, if I know I've got a mobile home mover that's willing to do that for me, I'll start talking to my park managers and I'll start calling my park managers up and be like, hey, you have any vacant lots that you want to fill up? I've got access to mobile homes and I'm looking for places to put them. Some of the things I'd like to ask for you is if I'm able to bring in units that meet your, 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 your standards for your park, would you allow me to bring those in? And if I do, would you be able to either A, help me with the cost of the move, or B, give me rent credit on the lot to help me recoup the cost of the move? So if I can buy one for $2,000 from a mobile home mover, and I can get a park manager to agree to give me six months of lot rent for free for moving it in. If lot rents is 300 bucks a month times six months, that's $1,800. It only cost me 200 bucks for that mobile home. You following me? Yes. Okay. So that might be a way for you to start. So that's a lot to take in. I'm, I, okay. I am following you, but okay. there, we're getting a lot of knowledge dropped here. What I'm doing is I'm cutting deals between the park manager and the mobile home mover. Because if the mobile home mover is coming across uh, homes and he's looking for some place to put them and he doesn't want to like drag it over to his lot drop it rehook up to it drag it somewhere else if he's already picking it up somewhere and he's you. already got it sold you know he sells it to me for two grand and I've got a park manager that I know that's willing to allow a 1989 or a 1988 single wide onto their lot, lot, lot as long as I put new skirting on it a new staircase and I have the exterior painted well they'll allow that unit into their house into their into their park I guess so but no matter what the inside looks like because it's out of sight out yeah, of mind they don't care all they know is they want the outside of the house to look good because it's their park standard that they want to have met if I know that they're willing to do that maybe they won't pay for the move but maybe they will give me rent credit, half off my rent for a year, no rent for six months. Whatever that discount ends up being is going to help, is going to help subsidize the cost of purchasing it. So if it's 300 a month and they give me six months free, that's $1,800 worth of lot rent I never had to pay. So you're paying ultimately $200 for that trailer. I got you. Yep. All right. Perfect. So y'all see well, how, how I work those deals together? And then just figure out what your parks are willing to do, what they want, what they'll give you. Find out what the mobile home movers have got going on and start playing the middleman and just start working that deal in between. Put a little bit of money into it once it's been dropped on there. Turn around and sell it for $30,000 on a note. Collect 400 bucks a month in payments off of it. So that's, that's how we're going to do it. It's pretty good. All right. Uh, something else that's out there is a website called ITTT.com. It's basically if this then that formulas. I think it's IFTTT or IFTT. It probably is. It probably is. But go out there and search for it. You'll find it. And you can set up formulas on there that basically say if this type of ad pops up on Craigslist, shoot, me a, shoot them an email immediately saying I'm interested in buying it. Um, and it's a nice little way to automate some of your acquisition strategies. So take a look at it and dig in. Another one, Search Tempest. It'll search a bunch of Craigslist at one time for you, like not just your local market. Okay. Search Tempest. Tempest, T-E-M-P-E-S-T. -E -E yeah. All right. Search Tempest is another one that's out there that's available to you. But these are all resources for you to find deals. The amount of deals that you do and find are all going to be based upon the amount of effort that you put into them and how effective and consistent you are with it. You all ready for another break? Sure. Let's take another break. Hey, everybody. <laughs> take a break. <laughs>
All right, so we're back um, real fast here. Uh, where are we at here? So where to find them? I've gone through all of this with you. That is a good, good, good list of resources for you to start pulling off deals from. Online classifieds and driving for dollars is how I got my start. And then I stopped doing that as I started having relationships built with park managers because I was staying full. You know, I had plenty of park managers that would call me up and be like, hey, I got a unit available, come, come take it. You know, so I was buying, like I think probably one of the, one of the craziest deals, I bought a 1998 mobile home probably back in 2011. So it wasn't but 12 to 15 years old. I paid 700 bucks for it. It's like whenever I'm telling you that these deals are out there, it's definitely a matter of figuring it out. But I paid 700 bucks for like a 12 to 15 year old mobile home. So, so I, I know a guy that's got a lot of doors in mobile homes and it's not who everybody's thinking, it's not Corey. Right. Um, and he, he dropped this knowledge on me. I didn't understand it, that a lot of times the banks will just damn near abandon the thing mm -hmm. if they get a loan on it because it costs them more to move it than they can recoup out of it, which yep. is where these deals pop up. So if you see an abandoned home and you know how to do title research and you find out that it's got a lien against it, reach out to that asset manager and be like, hey, what's going on with this? And you know, say, hey, I'd, I'd be interested in taking it off your books. How do you find the asset manager? All right, so we'll go through some titling here, but uh, Ryan, I sent you a document. I think one of them was lot 91 SOL or something like that. So while he gets that pulled up, what I'm going to tell you is anytime I look at the SOL, at least here in Texas, it will show you who the lien holder is on it. And what I can tell you is like right here, if we look at, that's the application for statement of ownership and location. So there should be another one that says lot 91. There you go. That one right there. So if we can get that one up on the screen, if you look at the bottom there, it says where it says liens, yep, no it says lien. no lien. So if there is a lien against that property, it'll show up there on that very bottom. And then once I know who the lien holder is, I can call that bank up and be like, hey, you have a lien on this asset that is abandoned. Would you be interested and or capable of selling that asset to me? Right. Boom. There you go. I mean, because they're paying lot rent for it, right? Somebody they may or may not be. So they, they may just abandon it and say, you know what, I'm not paying lot rent on it. And then it's up to the park manager to file an abandoned property uh, application where it says this, this has been on my property for more than, I think it's six months, it may be four months. But there is a way for a landowner, such as a park manager, to take ownership of that unit as long as they follow X steps. So that is a possibility for them. So is that a published document, like an appointment of subtrust? Um, no, I don't directly remember. They, they basically file an affidavit of fact for an abandoned mobile home unit. And for them to do that, they must complete specific things such as show proof that they tried to contact the previous owner, that they've tried to prove that they, they contacted the lien holders, and they must place a public publication, kind of like a thrifty nickel or a local um, newspaper, right. uh, saying that this has been abandoned, and if it's not been claimed within the next amount of time, I will take ownership of it. Uh, I've never had to do it, but I know the process. So in Texas, that's how it's handled. So that's another way that you might be able to find some units, is what you were just talking about. All right, so continuing moving forward. I don't know what happened there, but we'll keep going. If my wife is watching, I'm only drinking this because they gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> no sugars. No sugars. It's got amino acids. It's got creatine. It's got a couple of other good things in there. Bang, sponsor us. I, I like my bangs. If y'all haven't had a bang yet, man, I love them. Absolutely love them. So continuing moving forward, what kind of park am I looking to invest in? I'm looking mostly for the rules. I hope there are some rules, because if there are no rules, I might not want to invest in that park. I might want to buy the park, you know, and I'll, I'll figure that out from there. But if, let's say, they have pet restrictions, if they have age restrictions, if they have tenant restrictions, I need to know what those are. I also need to know what their rules are and if there's anything that's been grandfathered in, because that burned me on one. I was working in a new park, and I'm not going to get deep into this story, but their rules said they wanted uh, new solar screens on all windows. They wanted a front porch that was at least 10 foot wide by 18 feet. They wanted metal skirting. They wanted this, 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 and this. And had I known that prior to, I wouldn't have bought the unit. But that right there is a good reason why it's on my slides now is because I've learned my lesson. Figure out what your park rules are before you ever buy it. So you had to update all that stuff to comply? 
Technically, yes, but no, I didn't. Um, that park manager was intentionally screwing me. They were they they were very intentionally screwing me, and I'm not going to discuss that from beginning to end. But they were doing everything in their power to essentially get me to abandon the mobile home so they could take it from me. Uh, they were leveraging their their power as the landlord to try and steal assets from individuals. Which is what I was getting at earlier. Even if they're not trying to steal it at you, they have the power to kick you off mm -hmm. if you get crosswise with them. Park manager will make or break this business, by all means. Park manager is your best friend or your worst enemy. Um, like I said, restrictions, pets, felonies, age, rentals. If I know that my tenant base is more than likely gonna, you know, be somebody that wants pets, I might not be able to sell that park so easily. Um, you know, if I know that I'm selling to a lot to felons, I might not be able to, to do business in that park. Just take into consideration what the rules are and how you handle it. Um, there are age-based parks, you know, it's retirement communities, you know, if there's demand, buy in it. Just understand that you're not going to be able to sell it to anybody that's under X age, 55, or whatever that ends up being. Okay, uh, moving forward, what's included with lot rent? Is, you know, trash included? Is water included? Is electric included? Is gas included? What's included in my lot rent? Okay. The reason I need to know that is because I'm probably going to be able to sell this thing on payments that's on average about what it would be to rent an, a, an apartment of a similar style in that area. So if I know a three bed, two bath apartment is renting for a thousand bucks, I can probably sell my mobile home on a payment that's around a thousand bucks. The reason that is is because I know that there's tenants within the area that are comfortable with paying a thousand bucks a month for an apartment. If they're okay with paying a thousand bucks a month for an apartment, they're probably okay with paying a thousand bucks a month to live in their own their own house. So, so this kind of goes back to the the preconceived notions about trailers. And this is something I I had kind of beaten got beaten the face with. Cor Corey's the most eloquent person I've ever heard put it in my language that I can understand. He said, it, when I was discussing this with him back, back then, I'm like, but man, they could live in that brand new apartment complex there. He said, look, man, you know just as well as I do that there's somebody that will pay that $1,000 a month so they can stand there and piss off their own porch. Mm -hmm. And they can't do that in an apartment complex. And that's what it comes down to. There are folks, no matter what you, your conceived notion is, that you don't think they'll want to rent it, they will. Oh, excuse me, my, my hip is absolutely killing me. Lifted something wrong the other day. But let's take it. I love what you just said because you got to get outside your own damn head when we're looking at this and then what you just said is very much true and that is and I'm gonna put it in a different way it's the ownership aspect of it it's the it's an opportunity for somebody to say I own it what I've also seen and is very common is when people get older they become fixed income more often than not and they need to know that through their retirement that they can afford to live where else are they going to be able to buy something and say within five years my rent will go from a thousand dollars a month down to three hundred dollars a month so so you got to take that step further because here's what I, people people tend to put this in the same thing as the tote the note car lot right because mm -hmm. that's a very similar transaction but you are giving somebody an opportunity. If you go to Johnson County, Texas right now, I live in, I live in Johnson County, Texas, go find you a $50,000 house in Johnson County, Texas. You're not gonna find it. Johnson County's rural. Mm -hmm. You still can't find a $50,000 house. If you do, it's a nightmare. It is, there's no floors, there's no walls. Um, crystal methany went through it from one end to the other. You can give somebody a decent place to stay at, at a very nice standard of living for a price that they can afford and they will appreciate you for that opportunity. They absolutely will. I remember the very first transaction I ever did, man, and it was heartbreaking and heartwarming at the exact same time. I sold, it was a 1993 3-2, very nicely remodeled. Uh, oh, I say very nicely remodeled. It is affordable housing. I'm not putting Absolutely. granite or anything in this. This was for mica, uh, linoleum floors, but it had brand new carpet. It had brand new linoleum. The cabinets were clean. It had fresh paint on everything. It had the cheapest of cheap everything in there, but everything was clean and it was a nice place to live. He, at somewhere in his mid-60s, um, 
sat down at a kitchen table and bought this mobile home from me while he was crying because it was the first time in his life that he had ever owned the place he lived in. And I he, love it. And he, and, he could, and he never thought that he would ever own his own house in his entire life. So, so I love this because uh, you, you see all the social justice warriors out there that are out talking about stuff that they don't understand all the time. I, get, I had somebody dive into, my, into a comment the other day about paying people fair money and stuff and I said, you don't know what fair money is because you've never worked at the feed store for $6 an hour your whole life yep. and tried to afford a house. These are the kind of folks that you're given the opportunity to, to get a place of their own. They may be uneducated, mm -hmm. they may have had a lot of life issues, but they will appreciate that opportunity. And if you're doing the right thing, it's a win-win for everybody. And I love that. And that's one of the things that Mitch Stevens said that I loved on how the way he put it. For whenever somebody's coming up to me saying you're taking advantage of these people, my response to them is, all right, I'm charging them $1,000 a month for this mobile home, okay? If they could go out and rent a house for a thousand bucks a month, might be a nicer house. What's going to happen at the end of the year when they have to renew their lease? That rent probably ain't going to stay the same. It's going to be a thousand fifty, and in five years it's going to be fourteen hundred. Whenever I sell them this house in five years, what's their rent go to? Three hundred bucks a month. They own it. It's done with. They no longer have a house payment again in their life. Tell me how I'm taking advantage of this person because if I tell them to go out and rent. They're not going to be able to afford $1,400 a month in five years. They're going to afford 300 bucks a month in five years for their lot rent. So I just need to make sure that everybody that's out there saying I'm taking advantage of this person, I am setting themselves up to do better in life than what they currently are doing. Because there's no place that they're going to be able to go that's going to give them a, de or a decrease in their monthly expenses at the end of five years. Right. Okay, so that's all I got on that. So I need to figure out what's going on with the lot rent, the trash, the water, the electric, the gas. What kind of amenities are there? You know, if I'm looking at a specific area, you know, does it have a pool? Does the park have a pool? Does it have a laundry? Does it have access to, to, to low income transportation? These are all things that might affect what my tenant might be willing to pay. So if I'm looking at that apartment complex and that apartment complex has pools, laundry machines, fitness centers and all that kind of stuff, and my park is just dirt roads and, and trash piles, I'm not gonna be able to pull it off. So I need to kind of gauge you know, and this is anecdotal. I don't have a direct way to just tell you this is what you're gonna be able to do, but I try and figure out what stick-built homes are renting for, I try and figure out what apartments are renting for, and I'm probably gonna be able to pull myself off somewhere in that range. If my park, if my park meets what those other homes and apartments are like. Now, if I've got a just ragged out park, well then my rents are gonna be less, but I just need to understand what I'm investing in so I'm aware of it up front. It's, there's no way I can just give you scientific data that says, you know, what if an apartment rents for 800 bucks, I'll get my, my mobile home for 800 bucks a month. But I can probably do it if they're similar in, in tenant base. So, so, so the very first time I met you, mm -hmm. almost a year ago, November some time frame, literally, I came to a mastermind in this room when they were still hosted here. I talked about the one deal that I had on my plate, which was I was offered a $10,000 home in Granbury, Texas, a manufactured home on two lots, needed some work. I right off the top of my head, that sounds like a deal. Well, I met several people in that room that night, Corey, you, uh, other people. Um, I can just imagine that I could sell it for more than 10 grand. I could drop another mobile home on it, probably, probably make 80 grand. Corey told me I was an idiot. Like, he's like, you should go buy that right now. Like mm -hmm. I didn't know the guy, but that's the kind of guy he is. He'll tell yeah. me I'm stupid, right? And uh, I tried to go get it the next day, and I was still scared to do it. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, you know what? Screw you. I'm done with your dicking around. Mm -hmm. And it was a done deal. But I know, knowing what I know, even a month after that, that was a deal that I passed up. All right. Those deals are everywhere. They really are. You just got to have your ear to the ground to listen for them and know what to listen for. So, I mean, two lots, Granbury, mobile home. So it's already got septic, it's got electric, it's got water. Uh, I could drop another one. Let's say I pull another one in for 15 grand. I've got a lot, 15 grand, turn around owner finance it for 80,000, gone. Take the one that's there, take the down payment from that one, fix it up, turn around, boom. And, and at the time I was stuck in my head overthinking it because I'm an electrician by trade, mm -hmm. just like you. All I could hear was he was like, well, there's electrical fire. So I de redid the electrical myself. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. What no. I'm thinking is I got two lots for 10 grand. Even right. if that unit is bad, I'll yank it off and I'll go find me two units, slap them on their own and finance them both. But I was influenced by my own perception of what I wanted, not what the deal was. That's, that's what I'm getting at. 
And it's good that you've realized that. Always look at the numbers. Never bring your personal emotions to the table unless your personal emotions won't allow you to deal, do the deal. You got to get out your head on it. You just, you just got to get out your head on it. What's up? Uh, Tiger Butler, uh, I came across mobile homes every now and then uh, where the owner still owes way too much. Any ways to still make these, are there any ways to still make these a deal? Uh, mm -hmm. Mobile homes can't be shorted, correct? I believe a mobile home can be shorted. Uh, it would be a similar process even though it is personal property. The only other option I'd see on that is take a look at the UCC security agreement and see what options you might have to see if you can create a spread by taking it sub two or something like that. Um, you know, if let's say my, my underlying payment on that thing, including lot rent and everything's like 800 bucks a month and I know I could probably pull 1100 bucks a month out of it, that's an opportunity for me to cash flow on an asset that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to. But yeah, if they owe way too much on it, it would be a sub two type of scenario. Uh, one other question, uh, John Sebastian Gonzalez, is it possible to convert raw land into a new park? Yes, it is. It requires a lot more due diligence. It requires a lot of other things, zoning, planning, commissions, all those types of things. But yes, most definitely could. Uh, <coughs> so other things I look for on the parks is what type of parking. Is it covered parking? Is there off street parking? Is there spaces? You know, how, how are my tenants going to park? Um, what might seem odd here is the type of parking will kind of dictate what type of park you're in. If I've got dirt roads, I'm probably in a really crappy park. If I've got just... It might still be a great deal though. It might still be a great deal. It's just always think about who your tenant base is and who you are personally comfortable with dealing with. If you don't want to deal with Crystal Methany and her boyfriend, then you might want to stay out of those types of parks. If you're best friends with Crystal Methany, boom, that's the park to be in. But you just got to be, a, you got to be self-aware of what your tenant base is going to be. And are you as an investor comfortable with that tenant base? And are you comfortable with selling this to that tenant base? Do I want to own or finance something to Crystal Methany? Absolutely not. I don't want to deal with that headache. I personally like to to do my deals in C-class parks. Uh, B and A, A, A class parks, I'm not gonna get the cash on cash I'm wanting for. B class parks, I'm probably just not gonna get the, the, the discount that I need. But those C-class, those strong C-class, well-managed parks are the ones that I'm gonna thrive in. So how do you determine, well, this is probably like a whole class in itself. Like how do you determine what's a C-class park? We'll talk about that. And this entire presentation that I'm doing with you, I have broken down even further and it's gonna be in the academy. Uh, it's, I've broken it down into about an eight hour class. Wow. So that's all coming in the academy and you'll, you'll see more about that. But A-class park is going to be almost all newer mobile homes, uh, you know, very nice amenities, fitness centers, clubhouse, pools, uh, nicer tenant base. These are going to be retirement communities, just higher end communities. You'll see a lot of that type of stuff like in Florida, man. There's just, you'll, you'll see Florida parks where they're charging $3,000 a month for a yeah. lot rent. Yeah. Uh, so B-class park, similar, less amenities, in my opinion, a little bit older homes allowed, uh, but overall, overall, very similar to an A-class park, less amenities and things like that. C-class park, older homes are allowed in there, little little bit of amenities, so little bit of deferred maintenance, a little bit. So they might have a pool and they might have a laundry room, but they're not going to have a workout center. Right. And that pool and laundry room might be dated. It yeah. might be a little bit <laughs> older. Uh, no, it's still got that blue tile all around right. and stuff. C-class park, well-managed, you're going to have some deferred maintenance, you're going to have some older units, you're going to have a mix of client base that you're going to like or not like. Some of them are going to be problems, some of them are not going to be problems. It's going to be maybe some rentals in there, maybe not some rentals in there. But those are the ones I love. That, that's my low-income housing area that's still being maintained. You know, they still got rules, they still take pride in their community. It's those really negative C-class parks or D-class parks that I just don't want to have anything to do with. Parks are normally graded by stars, not A, B, C, D, E, uh, but they are one star to five star. Is there somewhere that lists these stars? Just Google it. I mean, overall, I'm not going to worry so much about the technicals of that because it's going to be slightly arbitrary. Gotcha. I, as an investor, I'm, I'm going to look at the park and be like, do I think it's being well managed? Am I okay with holding an asset in that park for the next five years? Am I okay with the tenant base that this park is attracting? 
If I'm okay with all those answers, I'm going to do the deal. This is probably oversimplifying it. When, I, when I'm looking at neighborhoods, one of the first things I look at is the cars parked in, in the neighborhood. Because you can tell a lot about the way a person keeps their house by the way they keep their car. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not talking about is it a nice car or is it an expensive car. That's not what I'm talking about. I have a $3,000 car outside and, and keeping it clean is, is just as good as keeping a Bugatti clean or something like that. I'm right there with you. It's going to be your own personal choice. I am completely okay with a well-managed C-class park gotcha. where I've got... Where, where the majority of my tenant base is working class America that's just struggling to get by. I am I grew up with far less than that and I am completely okay with working in parks like that. The parks I don't want to work in is where there's no management in place, they're allowing drug drug dealers and the the not so, you know, beneficial tenant base to occupy my park. Because that now means that if my park is occupied by those kinds of people, that's probably the only person I'm going to be able to sell to. And I don't want to sell my unit to somebody that is doing things that I don't want to have to be associated with. What, what's the risk of, over time, say you develop a relationship with somebody uh, and you end up owning 51 out of 100 slips in a park. You own, you own 51 units in that park. So you're really the, the bread and butter income for that park that you don't have, you don't have a dog in the fight when it comes to the land other than you can pull your trailers out of there. And Which, that's, where, that's where you will find yourself in the situation where you're talking with the owners and you're more than likely gonna end up with your own park. At the point in time you take the majority control of a park through ownership like that, your opportunity to speak with the park manager and this is how like the guy that taught me how to do this jonathan duggar absolutely you know powerhouse dude has offered me more than i could ever offer and if y'all are interested in learning more you know jonathan duggar another guy that's really good at teaching this is john um fedro f-e-d-r-o both of them are really good on this both of them have taught me a lot, but what you're gonna see is that at the point in time you start taking majority control over slips in a park, your opportunity to purchase that park is going to astronomically climb. So. Yeah, I don't know if that's the right way. Is slip the right word? I, I don't know I'm why. I just, it makes sense to me. Okay. Yeah. If, if you start taking control over that much of the park, you could essentially, if you wanted to, start strong arming them because you could literally take 51 units and now they, their occupancy went from 100 units down to 49 units and they're not gonna be able to cash flow on that. So you've got control at that point in time. It just depends on how you wanna approach the situation, but you're gonna end up in opportunities to purchase. So nice. moving forward, roads, dirts, asphalt, we've already discussed all that, mobile homes, parallel or perpendicular, on-site management and overall appearance. What I am looking at whenever I'm dealing in this park is what am I personally comfortable with doing as an investor? If you're looking for the type of returns that I'm looking for, and that's the 100% plus cash on cash, you're probably gonna be working in your C-class parks. I'm looking for C-class parks though, that give me, that give me comfort in the deal. I don't wanna sell my units to someone that I feel is going to be a pain to deal with. I'm looking for hardworking, blue collar workers that are going to pay me rent every month, not rent, going to pay my note every single month because I'm not a landlord in these scenarios, I'm the bank. All right, working with the park manager, this is going to make or break your business. By all means, 110% going to make or break your business. Interview the manager to verify they will allow you to invest as desired. This is absolutely a must. Do not buy a unit in the park without having a thorough interview with the park manager because if you buy it, and you find out that the park manager does not like what you are doing, your day just turned into, well, crap, I'm gonna have to move this unit. I've gotta do this. I just found out that there's eight months of arrears in park rent that I wasn't aware of when I bought this, that the park manager has already, you know, moved forward with the repossession process of taking the unit over. You know, there's all kinds of details that I must know, but the park manager must be 100% okay with me purchasing the unit bring it to the park's standards, which I must know before I buy it, and then reselling the property to a qualified tenant that the park manager is okay with having on site. If they're okay with that, I will then make sure again and reiterate that they completely understand what I'm doing. The title to this property will be transferred to the new occupant. 
I will hold a lien against the property as the bank, and I'm going to do this. Are you okay with that? So what are some scenarios where, say, you didn't reach out to the, the manager owner or you didn't communicate or they weren't on your side? What are the potential downside to that? I'm going to give you a real quick example of when this happened to me. Um, I got a really good offer. It was a double wide, four bed, two bath, mid to late 80s build that was in pretty damn good condition. Um, I got that unit purchased for $8,000 at like eight o'clock on a Saturday um, by the time it was said and done with. But I showed up on Saturday to buy it. $8,000 for this double wide. I probably could have flipped it right then and there and sold it for 16 to 20. Boom, just made a quick, quick return off of it. When I showed up, the park was closing. Like by the time I got there, it was close to five. The park office was closing down. The park manager was busy. I walked in there and I went up to the park manager. And I was like, hey, this is what I got going on. I've got a unit here that I'm looking to buy. My question to you is if I buy it, fix it up to your standards, can I turn around and sell it on, on a note and transfer title to somebody that you're okay with? Yes. That was the end of my due diligence. Boom, conversation was less than five minutes. I was in and out. Bought the unit that Saturday. By the time I fixed it up to sell it, the park manager informed me of all the other upgrades they wanted done to it. And that, you know, if I wanted to sell it in their park, those units had to be, those, those improvements had to be done. What went beyond that was I was now in direct competition with the park. Right. The park itself was doing the exact same business model that I was doing. And although I did talk to the park manager, or so I thought, the park manager did not want me doing what I was doing in their park. They did not want me doing that. So now that I've already owned it and I've already bought it and I'm in their park, I try selling it. And before somebody can get approved to go into that park, they have to go fill out an application at the park to become a tenant in their park. Well, I go through the struggle of finding a buyer to purchase my unit and I send them to the park manager. The park manager started undercutting my deal to sell their own units. I find a buyer that's got a down payment, ready, willing, and able to buy my unit. I send them to the park manager. The park manager's like, wow, you're paying that much for that house? I can get you one far better over here. I sold that unit at least a dozen times and then got undercut by my park manager so I couldn't sell it. And their goal was to force me out of that park. So, so they could take the property? Either take the property or force me to move it. They didn't want me to move it. So this was, this was a very nasty game of politics. And I ended up taking and selling that unit for 12000 when I was into it for sixteen. by the time it was said and done with. Took a $4,000 haircut and said, fuck it, I'm gone. So a park manager can screw your day up bad and fast. Um, so... So, and, it, and it sometimes there's a difference between the park managers and some of these parks that have been bought up by the roll-up corporations that are going through now and reacquiring these properties because the, the park manager doesn't necessarily have anything to do if they pass a, you know, if the, if the judgment comes down from on high that they're, it, you could be good one day and not good the next is what I'm getting at. You really can. So park managers will make or break this business. Um, you just have to understand that and be aware of it and come into this building those relationships if the unit if the part gets sold and then all of a sudden whoever's there now has a problem with what you're doing you're not going to be able to continue doing business in that park but the business that you've already done in that park should be secure right because you don't own those units anymore you sold them you're just the bank owning the lien so now the problem is is your tenant base is going to be under new rules and new management and outside of increases of lot rent which will probably occur, there's nothing they can really do to you other than say that I'm not going to renew your lease at the end of the year. And then that's a problem for that person and for me as well that's going to need to be resolved. It's just going to be a headache. It's part of this business though. Uh, I've never had it happen to me. It can happen. It just kind of is what it is, man. Um, some parks will pay to move homes to their parks, see what they want in their terms. That's kind of how I told you we can work deals with them in mobile home movers. Uh, see what they're looking for from you when you work in their park. Find out exactly what it is that they are okay and not okay with you doing. You know, like, hey, if you buy that, well, you know, they might tell you, I'm not going to allow any units in my park that are less than, that are built before 2000. All right, well, then what I'll do is I have my portfolio with me, my little binder of all the properties that I've done in the past, and I'll be like, well, you know, I'll show them a picture. I was like, well, if I have that unit, would you be okay with me bringing that unit in? And they're like, yeah, I'll take that unit. 
But that right there is a 1993. You said you wouldn't allow anything in here older than 2000. Well, then they might say, well, I'd take that unit. I just want to make sure that they look good. Gotcha. All right, so now, okay, okay, you're okay with bringing in units. You just want them to look this good. Well, what if you have units in your park right now that are older? Are you okay with me coming in and making them look like this and leaving them there? And they're like, yeah, as long as you update them, that's all I want is I want to make sure that the outside of all my units look clean so I can attract a better tenant base. So just figure out exactly what they want from you. Does that mean, does that mean new stairs, new skirting, new paint, you know, a tree, some flowers? What is it that you want? And then make sure that I follow up regularly and convey the value. It's going to be a network game. For, for everybody that just thinks I'm staring off into space, I'm trying to take notes here while I'm learning from Daniel because I have a terrible memory. So. It's all good. It's all good, man. Um, where are we going on from here? So understanding your sellers. This, this slide deck is about four years old. Uh, I've completely created a new class for the mobile home, for the academy on mobile homes. It's a bunch of different stuff where I go into a lot more detail. But understanding your sellers, I'm going to give you just some basic thought processes, and I've already kind of hit on that, is that many of these people have paid a lot more for their homes than they'll ever be able to sell them for, and you're gonna have to work that reality into their mind. They paid 50,000 for it five years ago, and now they're thinking they're gonna get 50,000 for it again. It doesn't work that way. That's gonna be an objection you're gonna have to overcome. You're gonna have to learn how to work through that with people and either bring them to reality or move on down the road for a follow-up. It's just the reality of it. If I've got somebody that's trying to sell their home for 20 grand and I think I can give them no more than eight, Maybe I can give them 12 if they finance it to me because I'm not going to pay them 20 grand cash, but if I can get them to finance it to me and then I can make the finance payment less than what my, let's say I get them to finance it to me for 20 grand at five years and four and a half percent. Okay, we can write those down. 20 grand, five years, four and a half percent. I buy it, I do nothing to it. No down payment, no nothing. I turn around and sell it for 32,000 on another note with five grand down. So I just put 5,000 into my back pocket that allows me to buy another unit. I have no cash out of my pocket at all. I sold it to them for 32 with 5,000 down. I finance $27,000. I finance $27,000 at 9%. So I've got 27,000 at 9% and I've got 20,000 at 4%. I got a yield spread. That yield spread is my cash flow. So I can still pay 20 grand for it. I just need to make sure that I can wrap it or I can do something along those lines to make sure that I still get my yield spread that I need. So don't let price always dictate what you're doing because if my cash, what's my cash on cash on that deal? Uh, I'm pretty lost right now. I'm trying. trying dead to eight? Get, dead eight. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm overthinking so, something. So let, trying to let, 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 let's break this down. They're willing to sell me their home for 20 grand. Right. I talk them into selling it to me on payments. Gotcha. No down payment. No down payment. I'll give you 20 grand for it. I want 4% interest. Okay. That side of the transaction's done. I just bought it. How much money did I have to pay? Uh, you, you paid zero down. I put, I put zero into it up front and I got a 20K note. Right. That's step one of this transaction. Step two, I have a buyer that is looking to purchase a unit from me. I offer him this unit or her for 32,000. 32,000. At nine percent. At nine percent. With five thousand down. They like it. Cool. Here's five grand. So I put five grand into my back pocket. Right. And I created now I've created a note. For twenty seven K. The note value of that's twenty seven thousand because I sold it for thirty two and I took five down. So you've created a an interest spread of five percent on the first twenty thousand and nine percent on, on the, the remaining second seven. seven. Yep. That's how you can do it with mobile homes. Dead eight right there all day long. Right. Cash flow. And and for people that so Grant's the one that I learned that from. Grant the, the, yep. won the the power of that extra nine percent at the back. The difference is when you're putting this to a seller, they just think you're making four percent. Mm -hmm. That that compounded interest at the back end on the difference between the two notes is very powerful. It is extremely powerful. So I can structure that front side note to be 4% on a four year payoff. And I could structure my back end note to be 9% on a six year payoff. And what I could see happen is I'll power down that first note and then I'll have four years or so of 10% return on 27 grand. So 
but the cool thing about that is, and we're, we're, getting, we're getting a slightly sidetracked, and what we're going to end up having to do is make this a two-part class. Just going to have to, because we are three hours into this right now, and I could probably do another three hours just to finish this. Well, I wish you but, had somebody that was smarter that would pick up on this question. No, <laughs> I, 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 I want these questions asked, because while you're sitting here saying that, you know, I should have somebody else smarter to pick up on this, Everybody that's out there has the same questions you do. It's not because you're not smart. You just haven't been exposed to this. And me exposing this to you is opening up new pathways for you to run down. And that is a lot for anybody to take right. in. So don't discredit yourself for asking these questions. Just realize my experience in this is far, far, far along the path. And it sounds like I'm a genius. I'm no different than the average man. I've just experienced it before you. So just understand that I'm no different than you. I'm just further along the path. Yeah, I got it. So. Let's look at the power there. I just created 9% returns on $27,000 that I never had. So for somebody that grew up broke, for somebody that grew up you know, doing whatever they had to do and they don't have money to invest, I just showed you how to create $27,000 worth of returns on 9% without using a dime of your own money and even making 5,000 on it up front. So you do not have to have money all you have to have is the knowledge. Knowledge will create more money than you would ever imagine. So, so for anybody that's, so I've been at this a year. I think I've learned more than I had when I first came in here, but it didn't sink into me what he's telling me right now, the numbers, that 27%, get an amortization calculator on your phone and do a straight, uh, a straight note at uh, 20,000 over four years and 27,000 paid off over four years. Your so, interest is 5%. And look at the numbers, the, the difference in the, the principle there that you're going to make over that. And then cut that to 27 and 9% and see the growth that happens there. When you understand that growth, like a lot of new pathways open up for you. What I want to do real quick is just look and see what an AM looks like on... So a, a five-year note at 9% on 27 grand is $560 a month in cash flow that I just made. Now, I'm gonna have a yield spread there, so I'm gonna have to deduct that, but overall, when that's been paid back, I'm gonna look and see what the total, total AM is on that. That 27,000 turns into 34,000 over the course of five years. So I turned no money at all, money that I never had, into $34,000 in five years. You literally created that out of thin air. All I did was originate, all I did is originate the money and that's exactly what the banks do. If you understand, if you understand fractional lending systems, if you understand how the Federal Reserve works, if you understand mm. the power of the leverage of generating and creating cash, all I did is use my Hewlett Packard printer to print out five pages of promissory note and all of a sudden I printed out $34,000. So that's something everybody should understand is how, how reserve lending works mm -hmm. with our with our system. But you're, you're absolutely right. You created out of thin air, and there's there's literally no other way to do that. You're effectively transferring someone else's work effort into your pocket because you created a document. In, in, in a few seconds because I had the knowledge and that is what I'm trying to do here with these shows that is what I'm trying to do with the Academy is to give access to people just like you just like everybody else in this room access to the knowledge that they need to change their lives forever because historically people like you and I and other people in this room that knowledge has been reserved from us we have not been given that I am teaching you stuff that should have been taught in school the power of money the thought process of money but we have had that removed from us and I'm trying to give this power back to the common person so that we are no longer controlled by where we started we have the opportunities to go where we want all we have to do is apply ourselves I am teaching you the knowledge that you need to generate $34,000 piece of paper. What's up? A uh, couple of questions and a comment. Uh, Jeremiah, everyone should have a 10B2 calculator. That is a must. 10B2 is a must. That's exactly what I just pulled up on my phone. Yeah. Uh, so Hale, sorry you may have addressed this uh, already, but how long is the term for when you're doing owner financing on these deals? 
whatever you want it to be my average were between three to seven years i never did one for seven and i never did one for less than three you don't want to wrap one for 30 years no it's because my payments come in so small that my cash on cash dwindles i want my financing term to meet something that still meets my investing criteria well i also think there's probably something to getting these paid off quickly you don't want to you don't want to have them out there forever right if if my return on ca i would love to have a 30-year payment i would love to have a 30-year payment but a 30 year payment amortized over what I could probably sell this for would only be a couple hundred dollars a month in that. payments. I want that payment to be high enough to make it worth my time. So let's say I buy one for 10 grand all in and I turn around and sell it on payments for 30 years at 30 grand, I'm not gonna be able to get somebody to pay me $120,000 for a mobile home. So if I do it at 30 years on a $30,000 house, my, my, my PI payment's probably only 200 bucks, which kills my cash flow, just kills my cash flow. I just have a comment for, for Jason because I do the same thing about the self-deprecating humor and whatnot. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have a notebook and taking notes just shows you how intelligent you are. Well, like, like I'm kind of joking, I'm kind of not. Like I'm telling you, the biggest limiting factor in my life has been my inability to believe in my own deals. And, and, and I have that, have that perspective right now because I'm a year into this trail. But you got to be able to gut it out for that amount of time to get a level of knowledge where you can start seeing these. There, there's people right now, I can name two people that I know they're gonna work circles around me because they have a can't quit mentality. They don't get caught up in the self deprecation and stuff like that, but that's awesome for them. That's great for them. But, but being self-aware helps us learn. The fact that you've stuck it out for a year has a lot to say about your, about your own personality you just need to get one more step further. You just need to, to believe in it more than... I, I agree with you. Yeah. I didn't believe in, in my deals or myself enough to get this done. I didn't want it bad enough. Well, I look forward to seeing that change. What I can say right now for everybody that's watching, I'm gonna leave this last 10 to 13 minutes open for Q and A's, and I will follow up the second part of this on next Monday. You wanna finish the slide though? Yeah, I'll go ahead and finish this slide. So I'll finish this slide. If you have questions, open them up to the table. This became the Jason Psychology Hour. Sorry. I want to see others win. And I am working through my own thought processes on how to make that happen. So I don't think anybody that knows Daniel or knows Ryan would think anything else. A year ago, this meeting, I've said it a hundred times, Come, walking into this room a year ago, I can show you the text message with Ryan on my phone, I still have them, um, where I had to harass him into getting here because they weren't really publicizing the mastermind changed me and Megan's life. We were circling the drain, and that's where I met the people that started me on pulling out of that. It wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for, for being in y'all's mastermind. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, man. I really am. Um, just, I'm working through my own, my own demons right now. Moving on though, understanding your sellers. Many will have paid substantially more than your offer and will anticipate reselling at a comparable sales price. This is where I'm gonna teach you where you're gonna to need to possibly get creative and or learn how to pull them out of that mindset of you bought a depreciating asset. That's all there is to it. You know that that mobile home is not worth what you paid for it and you're gonna to have to come to terms with what that new value is. All right, moving on past that, they will often have to face the reality that if they wanna sell for what they have invested, they will have to finance. We've already kind of pulled through that, talking through it. I can give you 20 grand for your mobile home, but it's gonna to have to be on payments. I know you paid 25 grand for it, but you did it on payments. Nobody's gonna pay 25 grand cash for this house right now. I'll give you 20 grand, but I want it on payments. If you'll give it to me, I'll give me five years to pay it off. I'll give you 4% interest on it. That's more than fair. If you're willing to do that for me right now, I'll buy it. If you're not, then you know what? I'll give you right now 8,000 cash. Oh, there's no way in hell I'd take 8,000 cash. Well, I understand. Well, what would you give me? I won't take less than 12. Does 12 make my numbers work? Yes, no, yes, no, no, yes. Okay, well, what if I gave you 3,000 down? Would you finance it to me at 12,000? Boom, now I've just made myself, you know, you just gotta, you gotta think through it. You just gotta push your way through it. And then last, some sellers will have minimal invested and will have almost zero connection to the home offering the opportunity to get homes for free to nearly free. A lot of the homes that I got at that price point were from ones that were like given to them by their uncle or their friend or their grandma, or grandpa, and they've just been living there rent free, kind of living, living the life as a, as, a, as, a, as a person. And now they've decided they don't wanna deal with the mobile home no more. They want, a, they want their own apartment 
and it's just a problem for them, you can have it. I, I get calls all the time like, hey, I got a trailer. If you'll move it, you can have it or it's a thousand bucks. I literally just been throwing those away because I didn't know what to do with them. Find you park managers that are willing to pay to have stuff in their in their or, or give you lot concessions or something, right. and there might be an opportunity to move it. So what I'm gonna have to tell everybody out there that's watching right now, I appreciate the fact that you have stuck with me for three hours, um, but this is a in-depth class, and like I said, I will teach you how to do this business from my perspective from beginning to end. This is gonna follow up on next Monday. I'm gonna do this class, the second half of this class. I hope that you can make that back, Jason. Uh, but we've got about nine minutes left here, and I'm gonna open that floor up to ask questions on what we've already discussed, because I still have probably another 13 to 14 slides that we need to get through to, to wrap this conversation up. 18 slides. 18 slides. So I'm not joking when I say that I intend to drop bombs on these classes. I want y'all to know what we're doing over here. Got questions, go for them. You, Jason, if you have questions on what we've discussed up until now, so, let's go for it. So I'm, I don't have a question, but I'm gonna drop a bomb you dropped on me. Mm -hmm. One of the best things I've ever done, when they sit there, when, when they ask you, they, well, I'm not gonna take 8,000 for it. When they always ask, what do you wanna pay for it? Mm -hmm. I tell them what I learned from Daniel Moore. I do it in every one of my negotiations. Well, I wanna pay you a dollar. Mm -hmm. I'm an investor, I want it as cheap as possible. I, I wanna pay a dollar. I learned that from him, and it almost always either gets them to tell you to eat, well, just go to hell, mm -hmm. or they will laugh at you and tell you what the real price is, or at least a lot closer to the real price. What I've done, and I'll, I'll add something to that, and I don't know if you're doing this yet, is I always throw that dollar out with my own little chuckle. Yeah. I was like, well, honestly, you know, I'd love to give you a dollar for it, but I know too. for a fact that doesn't make sense for you while it makes a ton of sense for me. But my goal is to get it as cheap as I possibly can. So instead of going back and forth, man, you know, Obviously, a dollar is not going to work. Ten dollars is not going to work. Where's that number that makes sense to you? And I just go shut it up. Just, just sit there and let them talk. And uh, I always try to make sure that I present that as a joke. Although I'm being 110% serious, I'll offer it up as a joke. So, but it does something. It humanizes it, mm -hmm. and. and and you get it out there that, that you're cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and they understand that, they know you are, but I'm not trying to hide that at all. And I try to make it a joke and it's just like, man, honestly, if I could get it for a dollar, I'd pay you a dollar, but I know damn good and well, that's not gonna happen. And, and that doesn't benefit, doesn't benefit you. So where is a number that benefits you and gets you what you need and still makes sense to me? Because if, you know, if I could give you $200,000 for your $20,000 mobile home, I would. But that doesn't make sense. This is a business and I have to make money. And that's how I keep you know, the food on my family's tables. I have to make money. If you leave enough meat on the bone that I can make money, I'll give you whatever number you need so that way you can make money. But the only thing that makes sense for me on this is it's a business decision. I have to make money. So if you're wanting 20 grand for it, there's no way I can make any money on that. You know, unless you give it to me on a, on a, on payments. So that's how I'll handle. It. Do I have any questions popping in from the interwebs? Yes, sir. Um, Brady Durr, we all see bits and parts to uh, Jason in our wa own walks. Some just choose to hide it from the others. Love that. Yeah, Marquise. I love how humble and human Jason Witherspoon is. <laughs> he makes it seem like anybody can do this. They Bravo can. to you, sir. <laughs> they can. If I can do it, look, look I'm not. I can promise you, I know how smart I'm not. I've worked in a situation around very, very smart people. I've literally worked in a room full of rocket scientists before. And when you do that, you'll learn how not smart you are. If I can do this, anybody else here can do it. As I've told the world on that video I released, real estate investing is simple, but it's not easy. There's, it's simple. Like you want to make money flipping a house. You need to buy it for less than what it costs to fix and sell, and there's your profit. That's simple, but it's not easy to do. So I don't know which one of you guys remember which one it was, but one of y'all said it in one of the masterminds, the, the original masterminds y'all had was, was especially wholesaling. Wholesaling is the hardest, easiest thing you'll ever do. I say that all the time. Wholesaling that is, is so simple. true. It is so true that, it, that we make it so much harder than it should be. Mm -hmm. Wholesaling is nothing other than getting a property under contract for less than what you can sell it for. That's, that's, that's wholesaling at the simplest of terms. I get it under contract for less than what I know I can sell it for, and then I sell that option to purchase to somebody else for the difference between what I think I can sell it for and what I got it under contract for. Nothing more to wholesaling than that, but it is a son of a bitch to get implemented. You, there's a lot of work to do it. It is hard work, 
but the concept itself is very simple. It is, it is very hard work sometimes. Mm -hmm. when, when you work on a deal for months on end and, and you finally drag it across the finish line and you get 33 errors. All right. Um, <laughs> That's a hard yeah. job. If you, if you want to see, a, well, I can't tell you. I saw a really sad kind of funny video from a seller or a wholesaler that had one the other day where the errors were damn near fighting in the front yard. Yep. At, at the Jeremy, end. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah I, I didn't remember. want to say it. I remember. So do we have any other questions or? Yeah, um, here's a question for you from Joel. Uh, Daniel, I didn't fully understand the scenario you explained where you get a mobile home mover to sell you a mobile home. What I didn't follow was how the mover has a property to sell you. All right, so let's talk mm. about that. Um, a lot of times, let's say I've got mobile home owner that owns 10 acres and a house. That house is a 1992 single wide and you know they just got a raise at work and they're deciding to upgrade to a brand new double wide. Well, whenever that manufactured home mover pulls up with that brand new double wide and drops it on their land, that homeowner is almost always wanting to get rid of that other one. And then maybe they use it as a down payment, you know, as a trade-in to, or whatever. No matter what, that home is still there. And depending on what that home's been slated for, that mover might be taking it back to a lot to resell. That mover might be doing something with it, but that mover picks it up. And if that mover doesn't want it, and he knows that I want it, he might just give it to me for the cost of the move. It's $2,000, he adds $2,000 to his back pocket and he doesn't have to worry about it anymore. Or maybe he shows up and delivers that double wide and there's that 1992 sitting over there on the corner and he says, what's going on with that? And they're like, oh, we're just gonna get rid of it to whoever wants it. Well, he's like, well, you know, I can get it moved out of here for 500 bucks. He makes 500 bucks from him and now he's got it up on the trailer. He calls up Daniel and says, Daniel, I got a 1992 single wide. Do you want it? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I'll give it to you for two grand. Now he's taking something that he wasn't going to make any money off of. He's got 2,500 bucks, but I'm not going to pay him 2,500 bucks. I'm going to get a park manager that wants that mobile home in their park to agree to subsidize that move in some form or fashion so I can essentially get that mobile home for free. That is amazing. So that's what I'm going to do. All right. Uh, a couple more comments. Uh, Jeremiah, successful people want everyone to win. Unsuccessful people want others to fail. Angel, transaction engineer is what we do. Yes, sir. Uh, Travion, I think he's requoting, if you want something you have never had, you must be willing to do something you have never done. Yes, sir. And then finally, this is a, uh, a subtle plug for us to, to expound on. Uh, John Gonzalez, thank you for all the knowledge. Sincerely, can you talk more about the Academy? Yeah, um, so for the Academy, um, we have invested a massive, a massive amount of time, effort, energy, money, resources into developing an online Academy that is free to the world. Um, and that is an opportunity for us as a company to give back to everybody out there experiencing the struggle for the people that are you know five hundred dollars away from a bankruptcy for the people that are out there that have been shown only one path in their life and that that path leads to prison you know death or drugs we're opening up the opportunity for everybody in this world that has seen a struggle to have an alternate path as long as they're willing to put the effort into into obtaining it and the academy is free it teaches everything I can possibly think of. We're teaching mobile homes, we're teaching short sales, creative financing subject to wraps, foreclosures, probates, wholesaling, rehabbing, flipping, new construction, uh, back office stuff, marketing, negotiations, sales, acquisitions, dispositions, everything in between that we can possibly think of is going to be provided in the academy. If y'all have not checked it out, it's free. If you think I'm calling bullshit on it, go check it out right now. Propelio.com forward slash academy. You can hop on there, no credit card, no fees, no costs, and start learning more than you just saw today. And, and I've seen across the internet people saying, oh, they're gonna put up a paywall one day. Um, Who gives a fuck? Well, I, I even don't if we even if we no, even if we did, I'm going to get rid of that limiting belief right now because it pisses me off. I am going to give you everything you could possibly want right now, and it's free. And your response is going to be, maybe they'll charge for it in the future. Get that limiting belief the hell out of your head. Oh, it's not in my. Oh, head. I know. I'm just. It, it pisses I, I, me off. It's like, <laughs> like I can give to this. It's like I can put a million dollars right here on the table, and they're like, well. You know? How many knobs does Daniel have right now? <laughs> it, it, no, it's just... You ask what Bang does? <laughs> so, yeah. so, no, the, the, it's very important, though. I, I know Daniel personally. I, I know he's only given to my life. 
you have the ability to take advantage of this right now, no matter what's in. That's where I was going with yeah. this. Right now, you can go there. If you're afraid, it's not going to be free. So there, there, There's programs that you can download those. I guarantee you I can screenshot that and record it. Hmm. So get all the knowledge you can for free right now. Right. And, and that's the point is like you... I am giving away such a great opportunity. If I could scoot my chair over right now. <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and, and people's response is, well, you're giving me a great opportunity today, but you might not do it in the future. It's like, what kind of limiting mindset do you encumber yourself with to believe that? Right. And those type of people, man, let them say what they got to say, you know? Well, my point was to highlight that it's free. Yeah. I didn't, didn't I'm, not, I'm not dogging on you at all. It's um, just that mindset is what's broken in this world. That mindset is what's broken inside of your mind. If you have that mindset, you need to change it because opportunity has been thrown at you, not even given to you. It's been like thrown at you and, it, you're, ju and you're trying to jump out of its way. Yeah. Well, it, my, the larger part of what I was saying is, is, is not just the academy. Like the thing I said, Grant taught me earlier. I learned that off of Grant. Teach me something. Mm -hmm. Like, like that was a, or whatever it is. Grant, teach me something. Yeah, Grant, teach me something. Um, you know, I've learned so many tidbits through this time, and I don't have the time to watch all those dailies like I wish I did because I need to be focused on other stuff. Mm -hmm. But I can go back and watch those in the follow-up. Like there are so many videos y'all put on YouTube that aren't in the academy yet. There's so many other things out there. See, there's a big difference between what we're doing live in yes. the academy. On the live shows, we're basically teaching a topic and just rolling with it. Right. The academy is actionable step-by-step, -step, eight, five, six, 10, 12 hour courses, where it breaks it down to the Beautiful. smallest of minute questions and then takes it all the way to the end. And we are providing a form for feedback for people to get questions dealt with on that. So. We're, we're getting closer to the end. Uh, I apologize on that tangent, but do we I'll, have any? I'll just do one more uh, a comment just because it's love. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, I can honestly say Propelio and their academy has changed my life. I, I now make more than 3X what I make at my full-time job going to a 10X in a few years, and I promise I know how to read. Uh, I just, it's hard at times. Sounds like it's time to quit that full time job. And yeah, that. it sounds like uh, it. And then as far as wrapping it up, I would just say, what is Propelio.com and what is it you're looking for and how can people get a hold of you, sir? So Propelio.com is an online resource. It's software tools for real estate investors. Uh, you know, if you want access to MLS comps, if you want access to discounted MLS properties, if you want access to lead lists that are generated daily, if you want access to a website for your real estate investing business, if you want access to lead management, Propelio.com offers all of that. Go out there, check it out. It's a seven day free trial that costs you nothing to check it out. Seven days, no credit card needed. Go out there, play around with it. If you need a website, check it out. If you need lead lists or anything else like that, check it out. Propelio.com is solid. And uh, our goal as a company is to help every investor out there grow. And what can everybody out there in the Facebook world do to help help Jason Witherspoon? Well, I don't think I have the right to ask for anymore because people have done so much. But I will tell you this, this year, me and my wife are gonna grow. We're gonna step out and start doing our own deals mm -hmm. uh, coming up. So I will be looking for partners to do deals with. So looking um, for partnerships? Yep. All right, looking for partnerships. Is there anything else? What kind of partnerships are you looking for? Um, right now, it's, I'm trying to open up my mindset to look at every deal in, in a multitude of ways to make sure that I can... Uh, so if we've got any transaction engineers out there... Exactly. We might be able to have somebody that, that can partner up with a Jason Witherspoon. You go out there, you find opportunity, find a transaction engineer that can help you take it down, knuckle up, partner up, and make it happen. Sounds good. Love it, man. I look forward to seeing you again on the show next Monday. We're going to finish the second half of this class, and I appreciate everybody that's tuned in. Thank you all.